Right, well, thank you everybody for having me. Just a quick introduction for those of you who uh, have never heard of me or maybe um, don't know what the program is about. My name is Michael Lane. I'm from Weigert's Bonsai in Southwest Florida and North Fort Myers, and I specialize on tropical bonsai and also shohin bonsai. So today's program, we're gonna run through a little PowerPoint explaining what shohin bonsai is, uh, some interesting ways that you can make them, material that you can use, uh, and also go through a few progressions that I've done at home to kind of give you guys an idea of how these trees are made. Uh, so I'd like to go through that. That'll usually take about half an hour to 40 minutes, depending on the amount of questions we get in. So feel free to, at any point during the slides, you know, send in a question. I'm happy to stop and elaborate or uh, kind of extrapolate on some of these points or elaborate on some of the things we're talking about. So all questions are welcome. Um, so our first slide that we're gonna get into if we're ready to go. Um, it's just your kind of quintessential Shohin display. Um, so we're gonna get in more, more into display as we get further into the PowerPoint. But this is kind of how Shohin are displayed. Um, they kind of need the numbers to uh, carry the impact that larger trees do. So oftentimes they are displayed in groups of two or more. Uh, and that helps kind of draw the viewer in a little more than just having one tree. Oh, now it's not working for me. Tab? Okay. All right, so shohin bonsai, or shohin is just the Japanese word for tiny thing. Uh, a lot of you have maybe heard the term mame bonsai as well, and that just means little bean, like edamame, soy bean. Uh, these are typically trees that are under 10 inches, uh, but realistically it's eight inches. So. More often than not, in contemporary bonsai, the, the shohin are usually judged at eight inches tall uh, from the soil level. Mame bonsai, a form of shohin, are less than four inches tall. So they are still under the subcategory of shohin uh, and are even smaller at four inches and below. Shohin is more about feel. Trees should be physically small and express the feeling of a small bonsai. So the problem with talking about formulas or numbers like a tree has to be eight inches tall is that I have seen trees that have very large bases, uh, sumo style trees that are approaching eight inches tall and yet are not one handed trees. Yeah, they don't express the feeling of a shohin, they don't feel light and delicate. And so that's why I, I, I don't stress so much on the formula, it's more about the feel of a shohin. So it's not just any tree that's eight inches tall. Uh, shohin do focus more on seasonal beauty, so flowering, fruiting, and colorful trees, as well as harmony, subtlety, and balance. So shohin trees, it, it is really, really important to have diversity in display. Different colors, different berries, different flowers, different foliage, different texture to the trunk. Um, so all that is very, very important. And seasonal change in Japan is really what shohin display is all about. Uh, where I come from in Florida, we don't get a seasonal change, so we've kind of had to uh, do kind of our own tropical bonsai version of it, utilizing different flowering species and different colored foliage uh, that we have year round. Do we have any questions so far? Continue on. All right. Shohin are freer and more abstract than larger bonsai, but a natural feeling is still important. And we'll touch on that a little further into the slides, into what makes them a little more uh, abstract. So just a brief history of Shohin. This is a little wordy, but I do think it's important to understand where bonsai comes from, the history of it. Um, so mention of potted trees in China dates back to at least 206 BC. Some authors state that it dates back even further. Uh, these potted trees made their way to Japan somewhere between 1180 and 1333 AD, and thus bonsai was born in that country. Uh, though the art of Shohin bonsai dates back roughly 150 years, Popular interest in Shohin did not begin until uh, the 1960s. Interest in Shohin made its way to the West shortly thereafter in the 1970s, and today Shohin bonsai are extremely popular and offer several benefits over larger trees. So now there are nurseries that, that are strictly Shohin nurseries that focus only on uh, growing Shohin trees and expressing the love for Shohin bonsai, uh, so it has gained a lot of popularity in recent years. So again, just going back with a little more history, uh, Count Yorinaga Matsudara is considered the father of Shohin Bonsai. It was through his efforts that bonsai, uh, Shohin Bonsai was popularized. 
and it was in 1934 that the, oh, hang on one second. All right, in 1934, the Kokufu Bonsai Association opened its doors. Count Yorinagi chose to exhibit his collection of Shohin Bonsai as opposed to his other larger trees he owned. So this was a big statement. Um, and Kokufu, for those who don't know, that is the largest uh, show in Japan, that is the most prestigious show in Japan. And instead of showing his largest, most pr uh, prestigious tree, he chose to show his smallest trees due to his love of these uh, miniatures. His bonsai were displayed annually until his death in 1944. Inspired other Shohin collectors soon formed the Zenkoku Shohin Bonsai Kumie and named their exhibition the Nihon Shohin Bonsai Mehenten. So this is uh, Count Maitsudare with his uh, Mame and Shohin collection. He cultivated thousands and thousands of these Shohin trees and was even known to carry them in baskets when he would travel. So he would travel with his Shohin trees and just couldn't get enough of the small trees. Here he is again, um, if you guys can see that. You'll also see that the aesthetic of these older trees uh, is a lot different than the aesthetic that we enjoy nowadays. The trunk lines are thinner, more delicate. We don't have these very, very strong taper ratios. Um, so it was a little bit different back then. After the 11th exhibition, the All Japan Shohin Bonsai Association was appointed to organize the exhibition and all others onward. These became known as Gafuten, and are considered the premier show in Japan for Shohin Bonsai. So Gafuten is essentially the Kokufuten of Shohin Bonsai. It is the most prestigious show for Shohin, uh, and that's kind of where all of our aesthetic stems from these days. Uh, as the next part of the slide says, this is where the current aesthetic stems from. So our current uh, chunky 6 to 1 taper ratios or more, the stocky, very compact trees, uh, that's very much pushed by the Gafuten Association and by their show. So again, just a close-up black and white of those very, very small mames. I know it's blurry, but it was the best photo that I was able to get of those very, very small trees. So Shohin pros and cons. Um, Shohin does have a lot of things going for it. It also has a lot of things that make your bonsai more difficult. So we'll talk about some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks of growing Shohin bonsai and maybe this will stir up some conversation out there. Um, so some of the pros. The number one pro is they take up less space. So one of the reasons I primarily got into Shohin Bonsai was I was fairly young when I got into Bonsai. I was 24. I lived in a very, very small townhouse slash apartment and space was very, very, very limited. Um, so instead of just getting one tree and having it struggle in this low light area, I decided to um, start growing more and more Shohin trees to kind of expand on the amount of species I was working with and to diversify my collection. Uh, I also found that buying Shohin, at least at that stage, was a lot cheaper. So I was able to get material uh, of decent quality, relatively cheap. Uh, likewise, pots were very cheap as well. Uh, but mostly it was the taking up less space. You can grow Shohin anywhere, high-rise apartments. Uh, you can grow them in Lanai's. You can grow them anywhere. Uh, so they are, are very easy to have a nice collection in a small space. The next one that a lot of people don't think about till it really comes time to move trees is they are easier to transport. So in the winter time we do grow a lot of tropicals and as I'm sure a lot of you guys in Texas do, you have to move trees when it comes to winter time. Uh, Shohin trees, I can load up 10 to 12 of them in a bin and I can carry them indoors or away from the cold temperatures and protect them very, very easily. So I can move my collection in you know, under an hour. So not, not a lot of work. Um, one of my favorite things, and this is gonna be kind of a tangent, I'll talk about this one for a little bit, is development is faster. So the way I approach bonsai is uh, the way they approach it in Japan and the way they approach it in Taiwan and other countries that are practicing to high level, and that's that I develop my trees first. They go through a development phase where I'm growing large branches and thus I'm also healing any big cuts I'm taking care of any large course work that I need to take care of. Um, development can take anywhere from one year for Shohin to 20 years for very, very large trees. But the larger the tree, the longer the development period. So with Shohin, you can still grow extremely high quality material in a fraction of the time that it would take you to grow a much, much larger tree. So 
uh, my development time before getting to refinement is much, much quicker. Uh, as we'll see, there are some trees that I was able to move to refinement in under a year. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't benefit from more development time, uh, but it was a proof of concept to kind of show the speed at which we can move with smaller and smaller trees. Uh, the next point is younger material may be used convincingly. So you can use very, very young material. You can use a uh, couple year old cuttings. You can use um, young air layers. You can use uh, seedlings. You can use a lot of really, really young material convincingly uh, due to the small size and the use and, and playing with the proportion of it. How are we doing? Are we doing okay question wise? Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the other uh, great aspects of Shohin bonsai is they are less apt to be overwatered. So Shohin bonsai, when they are growing this time of year, it's, I don't want to say it, uh, it can be very near impossible to overwater them when they're growing vigorously. Because the pot is so, so, so small, you're more likely going to have to water more often uh, to keep up with the watering needs. So overwatering is a little more difficult on Shohin uh, than it is on bigger trees. So now let's get to the cons. And there are big cons. Um, first con, which is probably one of the most important to most people that are just getting into Shohin, is that they arguably lack the impact of larger trees. So when I, uh, I've gone to nationals a couple times and I've displayed some smaller trees there. And what you'll notice is that when you first walk into these very, very high level exhibitions, these very large, masterful trees pull you right to them. And they're placed in the ex exhibit to kind of draw you to these areas of the exhibit. Uh, your small tree in and of itself will never have that draw. It'll never stop somebody in their tracks from, you know, walking by your backyard and have them say, oh my God, look at that amazing, amazing tree. It takes you, uh, a non-passive observer to go and pick it up and lift it up and actually take in all the detail to really see the impact of the tree. So it's not going to be as big of a draw in the backyard. Special horticultural considerations. Uh, Shohin are super finicky. The larger the soil mass, the less room for error. So the, the less swing you have on problems. The smaller the soil mass, the bigger the swing on problems. Okay? So you have a, a much smaller slight might cause much bigger problems on a Shohin pot. Like missing one watering could be the end of the Shohin. Um, so special horticultural considerations need to be met be that double potting, putting in a sand tray, um, keeping them uh, pruned or moving them to the shade at certain times of the year. Uh, they do need a lot more care than larger bonsai horticulturally. Much more delicate and unforgiving. So those of us who grow big trees or have big branches on our trees, if you have a branch that's the size uh, or width of your forearm and a palm frond falls on, well you guys don't have palm fronds in Texas do you? Um, okay, another uh, tree branch falls on it. That can damage uh, a smaller tree, but on a bigger tree, you just pull the palm frond off, you're fine. Your structure's fine. You maybe lost a few fine branches, but no big deal. On a shohin, it can be devastating. You know, it can really ruin the design. Um, it can break the pot. It can cause a lot of damage. So they are much, much, much more delicate um, in transport. And again, they're much more unforgiving. As I said before, less room for error. So you don't have a lot of uh, leeway to make mistakes. It might allow you to make one or two, but things like watering, you have to be really, really disciplined on to have success with Shohin bonsai. So often compromises must be made due to the small size, such as branch placement. Any of you guys who have maybe seen some books with old Shohin, one of the first things you might notice is that there are branches that are growing in places that are against the rules. Um, branches exiting from the soil line to become part of the design, exiting right from the root base, um, those are okay in Shohin bonsai. Because of the small size, we can't get too, too picky about the branches we're using because you're working with a very, very small uh, can canvas. The other thing is that elaborate designs are, are very, very difficult to pull off in Shohin bonsai. You can't make 27 pads on a Shohin bonsai easily. Usually you're going to kind of max out at one, two, three, and then a top, you know, because you just don't have the room before you hit that eight inch mark. Okay, are we doing good? Everybody doing good out there? This is a great audience. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are real chill. I, I don't have to, I'm, this is easy work. Um, all right, so the next thing is material. Now this is a, another great thing about Shohin is the versatility of material you can use for it. 
air layers, air layers on your trees. So you buy a, a subpar tree that maybe you just break it up into high quality shohin by air layering. Air layers uh, have made some of the nicest trees that show in uh, Koku or Gafuten, as well as cuttings. So a lot of those trees that are shown in Gafuten or, or are either air layers or cuttings. So they can make really nice shohin very, very quickly. Uh, one of the primary ways that I grow shohin now is with cuttings. And one of the things that I tell a lot of my students that I've realized is that by growing something correctly with cuttings and making no mistakes, by doing good, efficient growing technique, you can get to a high quality tree faster than you can if you bought something older and tried to fix the flaws and go backwards. So it's easier to just do things right, and you will bypass the tree that you're trying to fix in no time. Uh, so I work a lot with cuttings, and I basically try to heal them the best I can, try to use efficient growing techniques, and try to grow the, the most of the tree the fastest. Okay. Um, small young nursery stock. So again, we're talking that you don't necessarily need super old material to make shohin. You can use younger, less convincing material. So some of the trees that we've brought today are younger trees, uh, trees that are only maybe five years tops, and we're going to be able to make some pretty cool little shohin designs out of them. Larger trees that may lack taper or interest higher in the tree. Now, I've got a slide that's going to uh, talk a little bit more about this, so I'm going to bypass that one because it'll make more sense when you guys can see some pictures. Species with small leaves. So that's a given. Um, you can use large leaf species for shohin and reduce the leaves down. Uh, but it's way easier to use trees that already have small leaves. So if it already has small leaves, uh, it makes it lends itself to any size bonsai and makes very easy shohin work. <coughs> Species that ramify well with fine branching and twigging. So that's important in most bonsai, but in shohin, things like elms uh, do really, really well. Sea hibiscus do really well, ficus, um, trees that really, really ramify and, ramify and get fine branches. Because again, if you have a tree that exhibits even slightly coarse growth, because you're such a small can, really going to jump out at you and you're not going to be able to fit as much detail into your small tree. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing is species that exhibit seasonal color, fruit, or flowers are very, very important. So in Shohin Bonsai, we really do want to have some uh, flash to it. We want to have the tree really give off some color in some way, form, unless it's a deadwood tree, like a juniper or a pine. All right, so seasonal colors, very important. Any questions? Doing good? No? So this is what I was talking about, about trees lacking interest higher in the tree. Um, now, this isn't the exact tree before and after, but this was basically pulled from the same kind of imported ficus stock. And so the one on the left was very, very similar, and I figured you guys could kind of get the idea. Um, so if you look, the one on the left, it has a nice moving kind of S-like shape at the bottom, but then to the top, it gets very, very straight with no taper. So one easy rule to follow in bonsai to make good trees is just to keep consistency from the bottom of the tree to the top of the tree to the branches. So whatever environment shape to the bottom of the tree needs to shape the rest of the tree. So there is no consistency with that having movement at the bottom and then straight at the top. So you can, we've got a question. Okay, we're going to stop and just take a question real quick. So yeah, this from Jacob, he says, you mentioned it was hard to get variety with tropicals. What are your top species for contrast? Maybe what is your favorite tropical pairings? Um, well, uh, let's see, what would be my favorite? I probably like um, Desmodium is one of my current favorites. It gives off a striking purple flower with a very white, rough bark. Um, so Desmodium is one of my favorite current tropicals to grow. Uh, I have been experimenting with Cranberry Hibiscus because I really do like the color of the foliage, and I think that could really play and, and pop off on a Shohin design or a, a Shohin display. Um, Barbados cherries I don't think are used nearly enough in tropical bonsai display loaded with cherries. So dwarf Barbados cherries, Suriname cherries, um, any of those I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to doing more with. Um, let's see, what else? Gruya, lavender starflower. That's something that I'm not personally growing right now, but it's a tree that I'm very, very excited for for Shohin. They've been around forever. Um, but I, I do want to start really propagating those and getting more into those because I think 
that's another tree that's underused and could really lend itself well to uh, show in display. And so a common name for that is lavender starflower. Lavender starflower trees, if you can find them, even wiring up just small cuttings and letting them grow out uh, should provide some really, really cool show in. So hope that helped, Jacob. <clears throat> so um, his, so are we good to move on from that? We got that one? Okay. So just jumping back over here to the ficus. Again, we were talking about the inconsistency with the top. So this will always be a mediocre tree, even though it's a bigger tree. Bigger doesn't necessarily uh, illustrate quality. It can dictate price, but it doesn't mean that you paid uh, for a great tree. It just means you got a big tree. So to get a better tree, you need to have proper taper ratios, consistency in the trunk, rhythm, and harmony throughout the whole design. So an easy way to do that is take something that maybe does lack taper up higher in the tree and fix that. So the tree on the right, basically the tree was cut right where it started to lack movement and taper. A new leader was brought up to the top to uh, create a new transition for taper and we kind of fix those inconsistencies in the tree. So now this is gonna be kind of fun. I hope uh, everybody's tuning in for this one because this is a tree that if you've been following me for a while, you've seen this tree a lot. It's uh, my Sumo uh, Ficus salicaria. It's gone through many iterations and this is probably one of my older Shohin that I have in my collection. Um, so I started this tree in February, 2012. Uh, and basically I bought this as a $150 tree that was probably, uh, let's say about 18 inches tall. It was a multi-trunk ficus salicaria that Eric Weiger at his nursery had fused cuttings together to make a larger trunk. So it was several different trunks coming out of this fused base. So the first thing I did that day was cut all those trunks back. I basically spent $150 to just cut everything off. Um, and as you'll see in the pictures, I left two branches and a bunch of stubs. So those two branches were all I left on the design and it's important that we recognize that. I want you guys to really see how hard I took this tree back. And even a lot of our deciduous trees in Florida, we start very, very aggressively and work um, less aggressively as we work our way out. Um, so that's my first kind of step, February 2012 little up close so you guys can see those stubs and those two branches. And again, up close of the one, five different scars to the back. So in April 2012, this was just uh, a couple months later, the tree had given tons and tons of growth, making the point that I cut it back irrelevant at this point. I've already recovered most of the growth I've, I've lost, um, maybe not the size of it, but I've already gotten tons of stuff to work with, tons of stuff to build the tree with. Uh, so that's what I did was I basically, everything that I could, uh, I let things run a little bit longer, but in June, I finally wired out the branches that I had. And so just to kind of go back and let you guys see, is there are no branches on the left-hand stub, no branches on the right-hand stub, and I took those back very, very aggressively. And then you'll see that on both stubs, uh, they are pushing tons and tons of branches. Now with salicaria, and I'm gonna talk about this when we get into the live demo, one of the first things you have to do to develop the tree is go through those whorls that have you know, five or six branches coming out from one point, and you have to limit it down to one or two, two at most. And let, or otherwise those branches will never thicken and you'll just get like a big kind of whorl of these thin kind of ugly branches that slowly create little satellite scars. So I, I, you wanna thin it out, get it down to one or two branches per area, wire it and let it kind of run out. So again, that's a close up look of the growth that's come out and I only left two branches when we did the initial styling. Got a question? Uh, Summer, Summer would like to know in June, sure. mm -hmm. did you cut the terminal ends? Um, in June I did, yeah. So we're gonna talk about whether that was the right technique or not as I get a little further. So again, this was techniques that I was using back in 2012. So I have kind of honed some things a little better to get more efficient results. But yes, I did cut most of the terminals except for the very low branches. So if you look at the low left hand and the low right hand portion, you'll see that those branches have not elongated or thickened enough. So those were left to run. So this is it in November of 2012. I had started to silhouette prune it and keep it tighter and tighter and tighter. 
Um, it was still in a larger plastic bonsai pot. Uh, I didn't put it right down to a small, small shohin pot yet, uh, but I could have even done better than that. So still making good progress. So this is it. Well, we've hit 2013. I've got a great uh, structure here. I'm very, very happy with it. So I'm going to move forward. Now, this was kind of when uh, a few years after I cut my teeth in bonsai, I think I was in bonsai for four years. And so I was very, very impatient. I wanted to push things faster and faster and faster. So I repotted this tree in February, which is not the best idea to do your tropicals in February. Um, but I was confident it would make it, and it did. So this was it being potted in February of 2013, just about a year later from, uh, or approaching a year from when we started doing the styling. So I've got a nice silhouette. The branches are still kind of thin and immature and I could have done things a little better than what I did, but let's see kind of how it progressed from there. So this was it after that day. This was it in April 2018. So you see it has started to thicken, those branches have started to mature, and it has started to get uh, a, a lot of age to the trunk. Good taper ratios to the branches. And this is it currently. So this is how the, well, this is rather it last year. So I didn't get a, a final brand new picture, uh, but this is how it looked last year. I potted it into a nice Koyo pot um, and I'm continuing on refining the branches, trying to add more and more fine growth to the tree every year. So, yeah. Summer, someone wants to know when should sure. you have repotted it? During the summer? During, well, at least with this species, I'd ideally like to do it probably early spring. So I usually will do these trees a lot earlier than uh, uh, most of my other tropicals. So these are some of the first tropicals I'll do. Um, so I do consistently do them late March, uh, April even, and they do really, really well. But February, it's just more maintenance. It's not that I, it, I was able, able to take it in and out if we got cold, but it was just more of a pain than if I had just waited a couple more months and just did it when I needed to do it. I could have saved myself some work and some stress, you know. Um, and this is the other thing is trees, we've all probably noticed that trees, be it tropicals or not, they have times when they're growing strong and they have times when they're not. So don't ever do your work when a tree is not growing strong unless it's going to, if it's work that's going to make the tree grow strong. You want to do your repottings when you see the tree waking up from dormancy. So a good example is in Florida we have buttonwoods and that's a hard, hard tropical. And people think that, okay, I'm going to pot that in April you know, with the rest of my tropicals. And you can get away with it, but why would you do it when the tree hasn't even started to grow branches yet? I would wait, and I do wait, until I start to see them wake up. And usually that's about late May, and you'll see these buttonwoods in Florida start to get green tips and really start to stretch. And that's when I do all my work to them. And I feel pretty safe because I know that the metabolism of the tree is kicking, uh, it's moving nutrients, it's moving water, and the tree is actively growing and vigorous. So I don't have to worry about it. So uh, to answer your short story, uh, short answer, I would have just repotted it a little bit later. Okay. So now there are some things I would have done different, some things that I've learned since then, which now is very, very common knowledge, but I do want to touch on it. So the first thing is there is no rush to reach a finished bonsai container. It is fun to kind of put trees into bonsai containers at first. It is fun to shop for bonsai pots but it does kind of slow our efficiency of growing the tree down considerably. So the way I like to explain it to people is painters don't uh, go buy a frame and then figure out what they're going to paint in it. They don't hang the frame up on the wall and then say, all right, this is a sweet frame now, what am I going to paint in it? You know, you paint the painting and then whatever that painting you paint it is, you find the appropriate frame to focus in on it, to hone in on the best elements of it. So the bonsai pot is like the reward for your tree pulling his weight is how I think of it. Um, as that tree starts to get more and more refined, more and more branches, and really starts to look the part, uh, then I really think it deserves a nice pot to showcase it. The next thing is I would have allowed growth to run and heal the large wounds to the back. So in my hurry to prune it into a silhouette and get these secondary branches and to get a nice canopy, what I didn't do was heal the wounds very effectively on the back. So I should have pasted them with cut paste, which is my next point. I should have put cut paste on every wound, and I should have spent a little bit of time just running those low branches uh, to close those wounds better. Because it has now been, it's 2012, so it's been eight years since I did those cuts, and they're still not fully sealed. 
So I could have done my work a little more efficient, efficiently and not rushed to the bonsai pot and got those wounds healed and I would have had a much more valuable tree. So I'm still happy with my tree. It's not that big of a deal. It's just that we can do things better. Got another one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Someone would also like to know, uh, sure. can you repot that species in summer? She's got one from Wakers yeah. and she thought she needed to wait till it was warm enough or should she wait until next year to repot it? Um, no, you can repot it this summer and you could probably, is she in Texas too, do you know? Yes. Yeah, okay, is. so if you guys are warmed up here, you could even start doing the repotting now. But yeah, definitely do it in the summer. Um, I don't know how fast you guys get, get cold. So basically my advice for you guys in Texas is once you guys hit that, that point where you know you're not getting any more cold weather, that's the best time to start repotting them so they have the longest window to recover and work on until we then have to um, get into winter and we can't work on them anymore. So I basically just wait every year until you know that you're not getting any more cold weather and then you're, you're spot on. You can repot them all. So that might even be earlier than summer for that, that ficus. Sure. Yep. Like says, do you put paste on very small wounds? No. So typically it's a quarter inch or bigger that I paste. If it's super small wound, I won't paste it. Um, I just kind of move on. They seem to heal pretty quick because uh, I will be running at least this much growth, which will heal a teeny tiny wound like that. So I'm not worried about that. So quarter inch or bigger is usually a good rule of thumb. Um, so again, as evident by the final picture, it's not totally necessary that you go through all these steps and take 20 years to grow your tree, uh, but you can greatly increase the speed at which you hit a mature design and high quality tree by just growing things efficiently and just doing a little more forethought and slowing things down, okay? It, it bonsai literally is the tortoise beating the hare. The, the more care and the slower you kind of grow the details of your plant, the more uh, forethought you put into your design, the better you're gonna eventually have a tree in. So you'll always beat the fast guys. So here's a small buttonwood. This is very, very cheap material, very, very attainable material. I bought this for $50 at Eric Weigert's. Um, these was, was field grown, or not even field grown. These were pot grown cuttings uh, of buttonwood that he had wired up when they were young and put some twist into it uh, and then just let them run and get thick. So, once they were to a decent size, he sold them as some nice buttonwood shohin with cool movement in them. And, uh, I, and I just knew I could see some really cool designs in this material. So I got a few of those and started playing around. So the initial styling was in February of 2018. Obviously, I still haven't learned my lesson about doing tropicals in winter. Uh, I just, you know, you're out there, you get bored. It's a young tree. Um, I wasn't working on any of my other tropicals that were more refined. So I was kind of just bit the bullet and I said, you know what, I'm gonna do initial styling. So I didn't do anything crazy, didn't defoliate the tree, didn't cut anything back um, to no branches or no leaves. I basically cut things back to where I knew they would come back slowly and I did a very, very benign styling. One of the first things I did do though was start carving in shari. So um, for those of you who don't know what shari is, if there are some new members to the club, a shari is a deadwood strip uh, starting at the roots and continuing up the trunk uh, on a deadwood design. So one of the first things I did here was create a gin and a shari, creating a little bit of deadwood out of one of the spindly branches and also creating a deadwood strip, uh, just an oval starting at the bottom of the trunk and going around to the back of the trunk. So usually the theory is one shari to the front, one shari to the back for young material like that. So again, one shari to the front, trying to kind of split that live vein into two different veins. And what that does on deadwood trees, which you guys have all seen, if you've ever seen a juniper, when you create those two sharis, you're setting up the tree for as it grows, it's starting to grow in a ribbon-like cross section, in a flat cross section rather than a cylinder. So you're taking out one portion here, one portion here, and you're only allowing these veins to grow out. So every so many years, you'll see it'll try to close in on itself and you'll re-strip that wood out even further and push those contours out year after year after year. The other thing that that does is create incredibly dense wood because each time that that um, vein closes in on itself and touches, it's laying down another layer of lignified wood on top of the already dead wood. And so over time of doing that, you're creating very, very long lasting dense wood that's gonna last for hundreds of years, not something that's gonna slowly kind of get weak and, uh, and uh, break off or just rot away. So there's a lot of, of uh, cool things that that is doing when you're creating those sharis. 
So finally, um, once we got a little warmer, I did take the design back a little harder to where I really wanted it. And I, I'm very aggressive on my trees. So again, I kept two branches, one trunk line going up and one trunk line going down. And I put movement into them to try to match the movement to the trunk and I gin the rest. Now, I didn't even do complete the whole gin because again, I wanted to make sure that I maintained vigor and I didn't make the tree angry. Uh, so I ginned it about two thirds of the way and made sure I didn't get anywhere near those tiny little branches I was running yet. Okay. <clears throat> do we have a question? Oh. Yeah, one just popped in about what tool sure. do you use to make the shark? Ah, ha, ha, ha. So I'm going to show you guys these tools. These are some of my favorite tools that I use. I think I have one more somewhere. Nope. Okay. So these are my primary tools for creating shari. This is called the uh, Abiglen carving tool by File. It's a Swiss made tool, if you guys can see it. So it's sharp on this side and it's also sharp on this side and allows you to kind of work it both ways. And it also has a very sharp, almost like scalpel like tip. So it's very, very rigid and strong. Um, so I use this kind of as my cutting tool. Oh, sorry. I use this as my cutting tool to cut the shari. And then I'll use like a small little chisel to kind of pop off the areas of bark that I need to or to clean uh, edges that maybe were rough cut. So other things can, you can use an X-Acto knife, but I've noticed that because an X-Acto is thin, it's a very thin blade, um, it doesn't pry as easily and it doesn't, um, it can be a little scarier to cut through some of that meatier tissue. You'll tend to like have to build up strength and whoo, oh no, I, I cut too much. So I like to have something strong and rigid that I can kind of slowly apply the pressure and break through the tissue. Um, the next thing is this guy. So just a small chisel, just to kind of get in there and flake out the, the pieces of wood that you need to work out of those channels. So that's all I use to create the sharis usually. Um, now the rule is to keep the live veins even on both sides. So when you're drawing your shari, take time, maybe even use a pencil or a marker to kind of draw it out first so that you see how you're dividing it. Because when I was first starting to do that kind of work, I made a lot of mistakes drawing my lines and kind of making one vein too fat or not having it show up on the other side of the tree where I wanted it to. So take your time because you can't put it back on. All right, thank you, Jacob. Okay, so then lime sulfur was applied to also bleach and protect the deadwood. Um, it may have been a little premature to apply the, the lime sulfur for protection. So if I'm being 100% honest, I applied it for aesthetics because I really wanted to see those sharis bright white. Okay. Uh -oh, tab over. Is that what I pressed? Tab over, Brandon? Yeah, you just got to tab into the... Oh. Sorry, it's alt tab to get into the other program. Oh, my bad. Cool. Okay, so the two wired branches were then allowed to grow, and as they do, the twists are compressed. So for those of you who have seen my work on Facebook, you'll notice that I do a lot of very tight bends, a lot of tight twists. I don't do all of that at one time. So very rarely do I wire a branch. I think we've got an echo coming in. Oh, sorry. Can we keep going? Are we good? Sure we can, you, can you guys hear me? We doing okay? We're good? So should I unmute it or leave it? Okay. Oh, I gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So the two wired branches are then allowed to grow and the twists are compressed. So as I was saying is I'll wire them up and I'll put as much of a twist as I can, ideally without breaking it. Um, and then I'll go back a week or two later and compress it even more once it's kind of lignified and it's a little safer to do so. So you'll notice that you can get way more movement if you do it in stages than if you just try to go all at once on every species. So I basically go, I recompress those, uh, those twists as I go. But notice I'm not wiring up the whole uh, 12 inches of the branch. I'm just wiring what I know I'm going to keep because all that branch is going to be cut back to this much. Okay, I'm, I'm growing all that growth just for this much of the design. Um, so you'll see the top branch is also growing very, very strong while my descending small, my lower trunk is not. So some rebalancing needs to take place. Tab, do I do tab? No, alt tab to get back into PowerPoint. Alt tab, there we go. And then, oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So 
What I do to balance those is I didn't get a good picture of that, but when one is growing strong and one is growing weak, instead of pruning and slowing down the elongation and thickening of the branch, I'll actually strip leaves off of that stronger one and kind of let the other one start to catch up. So I'll continually keep stripping leaves off until they hit like an equilibrium and they're both growing at an equal rate. Um, so I did that and I let them run and I started getting good growth on both my lower uh, and top trunks. So you'll see this is where I made my first cut on my uh, lower trunk and you can see that those shari have started to heal and callus over. You'll also see that I'm already starting to push secondary growth from the branch that I cut. So I cut it and it's so gassed up with energy from running that it just pushes branches everywhere. So I get to take my pick. So very, very easy work. Okay. By January of 2019, the trunk lines are well established. The shari are nearly complete and the first set of secondary branches have already grown after pruning the two branches we were running. So this is hitting the one year mark, one year mark. And I'm not saying it's the most developed tree in the world or that I couldn't have done better proportions if I had continued to grow it out, uh, but it's a very effective start to move on to refinement. It's a very um, it, it, high quality tree. I'm happy with the work I did on it and I think that it'll only get better with age. So with one year just abstaining and doing proper uh, development for one year, you can really set yourself up for years of very easy refinement. Um, so again, just showing those shari starting from the bottom on the backside, curling up the tree. And this was it repotted. So again, this was it just coming back from repot. It looks kind of shabby. Uh, the long gin at the end of the trunk was reduced. I didn't like that it was so long and straight um, and it wasn't a very interesting gin. So that's another lesson I can maybe convey to you guys is that not all deadwood is created equal and just because you have deadwood on the design doesn't mean it's adding to it. So if it's not interesting, it's not interesting. Um, so I basically broke it instead of carving it. I just broke it and peeled it best I could to expose some grain, some texture, and I'm just going to let it age naturally. Um, the other thing I started doing was drawing my shari down onto the branches. So those spiraling trunk lines that are descending down the trunk and up, I started to draw shari down the branches as well so that I have shari on everything. Anything of size, I'm going to continue the shari onto. So this was the tree uh, last summer. This was it kind of at its peak after it had repotted. Um, and this is it in refinement. So what you'll notice is that there's several different leaf sizes on that tree. Because where I'm at on this, I'm still refining and I still have a goal that I'm trying to uh, aspire to. So I'm not looking for a finished look. I'm not going in and saying, all right, I gotta get every leaf the same size. What I'm noticing is that the lower areas were considerably weaker than the uh, higher areas in the tree and so I've been pruning them more and working on the upper areas of the tree more and allowing the bottom to get stronger. So that's why you'll see those larger leaves at the bottom is when I do my, my leaf cutting I'll maybe only leaf cut the top and let the bottom get stronger. So eventually as I build out more and more balance throughout the tree, more and more branches, I'll get more consistent leaf sizes and I won't have to pick and choose. So that's why um, Growing uh, everything equal is very, very important. Getting that uh, vigor kind of throughout the tree. And you can see the shari on the branches in this picture. If you look, you can see that it's already kind of healed up on the branches, but still giving them a, a cool little bit of character. Everybody doing okay? We got any questions? Okay. All right, so moving on. Uh, Shohin have fewer branches, so careful selection of the branches is important. We talked about that. Basically, don't just cut off every branch you have because it's not the perfect branch. You kind of got to really look at it and make sure that you're going to be able to fix the issue and not make it worse. Uh, typically, a strong taper ratio in both trunks and branches is desired. I don't like to give formulas, but the common one for beginners is 6 to 1, meaning that the width of your trunk, the width of that uh, lower portion of your trunk just above the nabari, your tree can be six times the height of that and should taper up to that point. Traditionally, informal and semi-cascade are styles that are most common and complement the shohin feel, but clump style, shaman, uh, clump style shohin are also commonly seen in a traditional style. Contemporary designs range from African style to windswept to boonjin with limitations placed only on the size and imagination. 
So it is important to know that that's not the most traditional approach, but nowadays as bonsai is growing, not everything is kind of geared towards uh, just the traditional uh, bonsai peeps. So another great part of Shohin that is kind of the, the other part that makes it so cool is the Shohin containers. And it's something I'm pretty passionate about, so you might see me get a little excited here. Um, so as in all bonsai, drainage is most important in selecting a container. So the horticulture of the tree comes first over everything else, over the aesthetics, over the pot, over what you want. The horticulture of the tree comes first, making sure that the tree is happy and it's going to grow well and you're not going to waste time and lose work. Um, so after that, we get to the fun part. Be expressive with your container. Shohin or small need to stand out from the crowd. All right, we're trying to pull impact. We need to create impact. We need to get people's attention on this very tiny tree. Bright colors, Painted landscapes, vibrant reds are standard fare. Standard. Um, pots should be in harmony with the tree and composition as a whole. Uh, so even if you do go crazy with a, a bright color or a painted pot, it should still kind of work with the tree and fit with the tree. Um, now just touching on those painted pots and why the, the pots are so bright and vibrant is a lot of those really cool glazes that you'll see these potters do, they'll only do them on small pots because small pots are safer to make for the potter, they're easier to make for the potter, and they're also, uh, once you get to a certain size, doing those techniques is, is cost prohibitive. So those landscape painting pots that maybe we've seen uh, that sell for you know, very expensive, $900 and so on, you would never be able to recoup your cost if you painted a giant pot like this. You'd never sell it for the amount that you needed to, to get back, or not commonly, rather. So. This allows potters to really kind of go crazy with their, their techniques and really do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. Gives you a chance to see and own pots that you wouldn't otherwise own. On that same note is it was the first time that I was ever able to buy a Japanese signed pot because it was a Shohin pot. And I was never able to get into that kind of connoisseur pot game because uh, it always looked so expensive for these big pots. I'd see people buying $900 pots for their big trees and I'd say, oh, I could never afford that. Um, but then I found that for a Shohin size container of, of high quality, you can get them for a hundred bucks sometimes. And so that was my, my first draw into like higher end Japanese pottery as well. I wouldn't have ever been able to afford the bigger ones, but I was able to sample because I was in the Shohin realm. So again, just touching on special horticultural considerations should be made due to the small soil mass. Some people place their shohin in trays of sand to let roots run out the bottom in case they get too dry in the pot, uh, keeping them in the shade, growing shohin in the shade. Soil collars, which we'll talk about, help to add more moisture to the, the soil. And double potting, basically potting the tree in another pot. So we'll show examples of that uh, towards the end of the PowerPoint, which we're approaching. So here are just some interesting pot choices of some of my shohin. This is a sea grape that was collected in Puerto Rico and imported to Weigerts, and it is in a juco pot. Juco is the inheritor of the Koyo kiln in Japan, um, and this kind of shows that, that very vibrant red playing off that very vibrant red new foliage of the sea grape. Um, so a pretty cool pairing. This is a, uh, just a big pot is the artist. Uh, it's a nail carved pot, so they carve it with nail heads, uh, and it's paired with a small Shohin Itoyagawa juniper. Uh, this is a gardenia, also imported from Japan by a collector um, that I received about four or five years ago, and this is potted in a Sotomi pot that's both glazed and painted. Again, a, a gardenia in an exhibit in Japan showing both the fruit on the gardenia and also the painted landscape pot. So a lot of different colors and a lot of draw for the viewer there. Now this is what I meant about soil collars, okay? A soil collar is something that's used a lot in Taiwan. I do see it in Japan, uh, but I, I see it a ton in uh, artist picks from Taiwan. And so the soil collar just basically gives you an extension to your soil mass. So Let's say you're, you don't want to burn off your fine nabari roots. You can place a soil collar, elevate the height of the pot, add more soil, and you'll get all the benefits of more soil um, uh, without any of the drawbacks. So um, 
sometimes I will use that to kind of hold more moisture in a small pot or to even just build out more ramification and give the roots more power if they need it. This is another look at that soil collar and also double potted. So you'll see this one is also in two pots, a pot in a pot. And this is a sea hibiscus. So this is one of the trees we're going to be working on. Uh, the leaves typically start out about this size uh, and can be worked down to, you know, a dime uh, with, with time and uh, ramifying the tree with good technique. So this is a nursery in Taiwan just showing the technique. Just about all of these trees are double potted with soil collars. Um, Taiwan is, can be pretty hot at times as well, so this is a, a great technique to kind of add more moisture to the plant. Okay, again, showing those double pots and the soil collars. And again, just a close-up showing those collars. So real quick, just moving through display, and then we'll, I think we'll get into the demo portion. Are we doing okay on time? Oh, yeah. All right, cool. So this is a Shohin display by Mort Nalbeck. Mort Nalbeck um, is an author of the uh, Shohin book. I forget what it's called, the modern, no, I forget what his Shohin book is called, but he's a well-known Shohin artist. Um, was one of the first guys to really put out a Shohin book in English, and so this is one of his displays. You can see that he does have a lot of different trees here, different fruiting uh, bodies, different colors, different texture to the bark. Every pot is different, so we're going to talk about some of those differences now. So Shohin are typically displayed in compositions of two or more trees, so they're almost never shown just by themselves. Often a formal, less eccentric tree sits at the top of the display, typically a pine or juniper. So you want to have something um, considered like the patriarch. So that's why they usually pick the pine. They consider that the most revered bonsai subject, it's the oldest bonsai subject, and it's the grandfather of bonsai. So it sits above all else. Um, other trees could be a juniper of similar stateliness, or in Florida we joke that it would be a buttonwood or a cypress tree, you know, because we don't have a lot of pines or junipers. Um, trees should be of all different species, varying color, texture, and shape. So basically you're trying to make sure you're not repeating any elements throughout the display. You want to have as many different elements as you can without repeating. Pots should also vary in color, shape, and design. All trees should have a stand as well. So that's important. Let's look at that. So there is a lot that goes into a Shohin display. So you'll notice that they're put into the five-point display cabinet first with another display off to the side. But then each element of the display has its own stand within that stand. So you'll see like the pine is sitting on a small jitta on the top of the stand. Um, the semi-cascade in the lower portion is sitting on a semi-cascade stand within that cabinet and so on and so forth. So you're not just sticking it in the cabinet and done. You still need to kind of have stands within that. Display should also have a flow or rhythm. Typically the flow is circular and continuous. So if you look at this uh, picture, I, you'll see that it kind of starts from one side and you'll see the direction of the trees pulls you to the right and then the tree off to the right pushes you to the left, continuing that kind of circular motion to keep your eye centered, okay? And this is a good two tree display by Morton Albeck. This is a very, very clever one. I really like it. Uh, because the scroll is of an old Japanese top, you know, like the toy, one that you'd spin around. Uh, and the tree is also very twisty. So I thought that was a cool tie-in between the scroll and the tree. Also, the pot is very, very expressive on this tree, a painted pot, also loaded with twists, turns, and we've got tons of yellow berries. So that's a very, very uh, impactful show-in. That's something that would be fun to look at. So now just finishing up with some Shohin galleries. Some of these are my trees. Some of them are by artists that I really respect. Uh, so this is my Shohin Nia that I displayed in Nationals. It's actually a Kifu tree, not quite a Shohin, but uh, a lot of people refer to it as a Shohin. Now this is a Shohin Sea Hibiscus by uh, Min Lo. So just to kind of show the, the ramification, because this is going to be the tree that we're working on today. So this is our Sea Hibiscus for today. Can they see that? Is that in the frame? Oh, sorry, I'm going to, yeah. So this is our sea hibiscus for today. So it doesn't look very impressive yet, uh, but with good care, good maintenance, and uh, good technique, you can start to build them out, and you'll see 
that the next one is this amazingly ramified, almost looks like coral when they're fully ramified. Um, and it's not easy to do it with, with that species, but it is possible by just doing good development, breaking down into good refinement, and continuing to build out smaller and smaller branches. So this is by an artist that I really, really respect, Min Lo in Taiwan. Another sea hibiscus by Min Lo in Taiwan. So these are very, very small trees, uh, handheld shohin, just loaded with ramification. Very, very fine branching. And this one's blurry for some reason, but this is a very chunky um, sea hibiscus by Min Lo. Again, just loaded with ramification. So one of the most important aspects of bonsai is that your tree, above all else, should look old. So above the reverse taper rule, above the branches inside of the curves, on the, the, this is getting too fat, that's getting too small. The first and foremost rule is that it needs to look old. So sometimes these reverse taper, these warts, these, these protrusions add to the age and it's not nearly as much of a flaw as it would be on a younger tree. Okay? Uh-oh, what's happening? Oh. <laughs> There's like an arm coming through. Um, so this is just quick little jade that I did. This was a jade that, and I should have got the, the finished picture here because this other one is from years ago. Uh, but this was a small cutting just stuck in a pot and slowly progressing to be better and better shohin year after year. And the last pick is just a typical kind of two tree display from Japan uh, with a root over rock maple in a painted pot and a gardenia in a nice baby blue pot. Simple and effective little shohin display. And I think that's all I have. That's it. Okay, so you guys made it through the PowerPoint. That's the hardest part of this whole program. Um, do we have any questions? Before I go into, there's a few. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I wonder if we were about double potting. So okay. When you have two containers, yes. What's the frequency that you check the roots on that first container, or when and why? Um, that was the first question. So the first question is, how often do I check the roots on the double potted container? So how often am I actually looking in that second one? Um, I usually try to do that about once a year because double potting's not the same as putting it in a bigger pot. You do run some, uh, there are some cons to it that need to be adjusted. So what happens in double potting is that in the bonsai pot, a few roots will find the drain hole. And as they find that drain hole, they'll also find the soil underneath it. And so they'll uh, run very, very quickly into that soil and they'll turn coarse, meaning that they'll get fat and they'll get strong, which means they'll start pulling energy from other roots and other parts um, that you might need it. So long term, you'll end up losing more and more of your feeder roots in the top pot, and they'll just go into feeding that lower root set. So probably about once a year, I'll usually cut them away and redo it, kind of let it rerun out the bottom. Um, or even if I have a tree that's in refinement that's not having issues, that I'm not trying to do any progression with, then I might not even double pot it. Um, it's really only a case-by-case -case situation where I'm having trouble either developing an area or I'm having trouble keeping it wet throughout the day and I can't get home to water a second time. Um, so that's really what double potting is for, is let's say you, you pushed a tree to refinement too fast and you have some details that maybe you need to work out and you need a few coarse roots to push coarse growth, that's kind of what double potting works for. Um, another question? Yeah, are there anything, um, anything in particular you would consider for making shogun conifers? Oh yeah, um, junipers are one of my favorite for shohin conifers and black pines. Obviously, black pines make very, very good uh, shohin conifers. Now, you know we're not like conifer city down in Florida, so my experience with some of the more rare conifers, you know, um, Douglas firs, Blue Alps junipers, um, Ponderosa pines. I I've never worked with that material, so I don't really know. Uh, but I do know the same thing I did with the buttonwood. That same thing I showed you guys in the progression. That's techniques I pulled from Japanese juniper shohin uh, theory. It's the same thing that they do. So if you were to go to a nursery, a shohin nursery in Japan, and look at how they make junipers, they'd take a young whip, they'd wire it up, and they'd bend it in a bunch of different ways that they're not really cognizant of. They're not thinking, okay, I'm gonna go a little to the left, a little to the right. No, they're just a force of nature. They just flip it over. And then they grow that tree out. And as that tree grows, they might come out and wire it again and twist everything else on it. Because what they're looking for is that in time, one of those trunks will become gin, a spindly gin with cool character, and one will become the spinning uh, character of the tree. And then they'll start doing the shari work, going all around those spirals. And so you create a very effective, very cool tree quickly with conifers. 
So um, I hope that answered your question well. Junipers uh, definitely make easy show hidden material. Um, any others? Okay, cool. All right, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so what I did a little differently for this program um, that I'm kind of happy about was oftentimes when I do show hidden programs, people want a demo tree. And unfortunately, like show hidden doesn't lend itself to demos. It's not the easiest thing to kind of create a show hidden as a demo unless we were maybe talking about refinement work or repotting or something like that. Uh, but styling and creating shohin out of thin air is something that's very difficult to do on one tree and explain the concept. So instead, what I did, instead of putting all of our time into one tree, I decided to take several projects and talk about how I would approach them and how I would make them shohin bonsai. And some of these techniques, I'm going to do them just like I did at home. So they are going to be pretty aggressive and they might move pretty quickly and some will not. So, um, but I want you guys to see the real work and how I would approach it at home. So I did bring some trees with us from Weigert. Uh, four of them are tropicals. And then Brandon is lending us a Chinese elm to talk a little bit about deciduous shohin. Um, realistically, aesthetically, I style a lot of my tropicals very similar to broadleaf design. So deciduous tree design. Um, so a lot of those theories as far as pruning, ramification will still work the same. Uh, the only thing you need to watch out for on deciduous trees, obviously, is knowing how many flushes you're going to get out of a tree, how, many t how hard you can work a tree in a season, uh, because that's much different than a tropical. So our first one that I'll probably start with here is a Ficus salicaria 89. Okay, This is a species um, that I don't remember the exact history of it, but I know it was one that was uh, discovered by Jim Smith, who's a Florida bonsai pioneer, uh, in his nursery while growing. Uh, normal salicaria. It has a typically a wider leaf than a normal salicaria, uh, but most of the other attributes are fairly similar. They do seem to grow a lot faster than a salicaria, maybe owing to that larger leaf set. Um, so they are a little bit uh, more vigorous, I would say. So one of the first things I would do so that you guys can see is I'm going to make my, my first trunk chop. So one of the things I noticed when I looked at this thing is obviously Shohin, we have a uh, height that we have to achieve. We have to be under eight inches. So eight inches is roughly going to be to the top of my thumb. Okay. So that's how high our final tree needs to be. But that's not the only caveat. It's not just taking eight inch sticks and putting them in pots. It's basically building taper and branches and working the taper slowly up to the finishing point of your design. So it should taper from the bottom to the top. So we have a distinct problem here on this 89 because we don't have much taper, uh, basically stops right here. We don't have any taper from here up. So that's something that unfortunately is not going to benefit us in Shohin design. And there's no technique that's going to be able to fold that in on itself and fix that issue other than removing it completely. So that's going to be my move is to remove that trunk line. And I'll show you guys how I do it. And then we'll talk about the next move. Okay. So usually when I remove a trunk like this, especially on something like a ficus that I'm, it's not going to be an issue to recut the wound. I'm going to cut a little high, like a buffer so that I don't um, damage any of the branches while I'm pruning. And then I'll use one of my tools to kind of go a little lower. I really like Brandon's saw. It's very sharp. Okay. So once I start making it towards the end, I slow my cut and timber. Okay. So that's the first start. Okay. We remove the height and start to introduce taper to the design. I'm then going to take my knob cutter and kind of work that wound back a little bit more. So I'm going to try and taper the wound uh, into the branch, the new leader, which is going to be one of this cluster, which is what we were referring to earlier. Now, another thing, because we're always talking about development and stuff, the other thing is repotting this. So just because I say that you shouldn't repot to a bonsai pot doesn't mean that you shouldn't start working on the roots of your tree because spending all your time up here is not bonsai. Okay. 
because you won't get very far here until you start focusing more on here. This fuels this. So the stronger you get these roots um, and the more care you put into these roots, the more you're gonna see it to the top. So a lot of times I'll bite the bullet and one of the first things I'll do is repot the tree at the same time that I style it. And what I mean by that is I might even take it right out of this pot, mesh the bottom, and repot it in bonsai soil. Fix any roots I need to fix, cut any like major problems that I wanna cut within reason. And now that also has a con too, because once we do the root work, you're gonna slow the top temporarily. It's not gonna grow as fast, but you're gonna be happy that you did that and you bit the bullet sooner, because then everything else that comes after that is easier. So the first thing I usually focus on is trying to get the roots repotted as well as setting an initial design. So obviously we're not gonna do that today because that's gonna be too messy and too much time, but um, whoever gets this tree, it wouldn't be a bad idea to repot it. Okay, the next thing is I want to slightly concave my wounds. I know that's, that's a given, you know, any of us who've done a beginner class, we know that we want like kind of concave wounds on that, but you see how I've kind of bowled that out. I can, there's my little piece that was in there. So now the next thing I'm gonna do is just double check, make sure that it looks good. I need to go a little further. And then I'm gonna paste this wound and I'm gonna select my branches to grow out on the tree. Okay. Check it again, almost there, one more bite. Okay. The next thing I might even do, I always have an X-Acto knife. These are super, super handy for doing bonsai. I use them for all sorts of things, uh, not least of which is kind of cleaning the edges on wounds. So like if you have some height discrepancies or it's not a clean edge, you can go with the X-Acto knife and kind of clean that edge to make sure it heals a little better. Okay. All right, so then I put paste. Now, I, you can use a variety of different cutting paces, paste, pastes. Um, you can use a variety of different cutting pastes. Uh, I really like the putty that they sell from Japan. Um, supposedly it does have kind of a, a hormone in it that helps roll over. I don't know how true that is because I can't read Japanese. Um, but what I do know is that you can use any number of things to paste the wound and get the same result. Because what you're trying to do and what I like to teach people is the why. The why is so much more important than the what, okay? So the why we're pasting is that we need to seal moisture from the plant in that wound. We don't want that wound to dry out from inside. We also don't want moisture from outside penetrating that wound. So one of the easiest ways to encourage healing on the wound is to keep it moist um, and prevent it from transpiring and drawing out moisture, and then it will start rolling over immediately instead of dying back and then having to catch back up. So cut paste can be anything. You can technically use tin foil as a means of just sealing it, but there are some things that work easier and some things that work better. So we were just doing some projects earlier where I was using duct seal from what, Home Depot? Yeah, duct seal from Home Depot, and I actually was really liking it. I, I felt that it was a, a nice cut paste. So, so you'll see I get it pasted like that, okay? And now we got to work through these ugly, ugly branches. Okay, take off the price tag. Right. Okay. Uh, Jacob yeah. wants to know if you made that flat chop bar diagonal with the knot cutter. Yeah. Yep. I did. So I made it angle. I go straight across first, and I won't always do that. You know, some hardwood trees, I'm not going to make a, a stub cut and then go and do the same effort to recut it. Uh, but with a ficus, it's soft enough that I'm really just trying to clear out the top portion so that I can get my tool in there and work away on that nub safely. So, um, so yeah, I did a flat cut first and then more accurately took it away with the knob cutter. So now our big issue is this, and this is something that all salicaria do, 89s do it, uh, regular salicaria do it, and when I go and I travel to people's collections, it's one of the things I see most commonly left on trees that's incorrect. So you'll see there's probably, let's count from one point, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, at least 12 branches growing from one point. So it's like a reverse taper nightmare waiting to happen. So what I mean by thinning these out is I'll usually go through and try and create good um, division. Like I want to try and space them out as much as I can around the design 
but also only leaving a few from each quadrant. So we're probably going to end up with three or four branches on this tree. Okay. Sweet. Okay, cool. So you guys see here's this row of branches. I'm going to keep this one and I'm going to keep this one to the top because those are nice, already kind of thickened branches that have um, shown themselves on the design. So I'm just going to continue to put energy into those. But if you don't do this, then none of the branches, or at least they will take a lot longer to actually get any thickness to them. You'll notice that you'll just have this like whirl with a bunch of thin like hair-like branches. It'll just like hair growing out of the tree. And until you kind of thin them out to one or two, the tree will just keep dividing that vigor too many times and you won't get any thickness. We want the thickness. So this is also what I was talking about, about satellite scars. Okay, this is an ugly feature to, to bonsai, and this is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of uh, too many sacrifice branches growing right off the trunk. But as you can see, because of all those suckers, we now have this like um, orbiting ring of uh, scars, little tiny scars. So those small ones will heal, it's not that big of a deal, uh, but on bigger, bigger wounds or bigger branches that you're dealing with that constantly, uh, that can start to create an unsightly area. So I'm going to try and just trim those back a little bit more. Okay. All right, so that's our, our three that we're leaving on this section for now. And I may even, as the tree develops, I may even limit it to one, you know, depending on how it looks. So now I'm going to come to the other side of the tree and we have a quadrant of four branches growing, almost right on top of one another. So I think I'm going to take that one from the top. Whoops, I didn't mean to throw that behind me so aggressively. <laughs> we have like this bin here that's all set up to catch debris and I just throw it on his floor. Yeah. So, okay, so we thin that out. Now we have one over here, take this little guy out. And then there, you see there's some clusters to the back. Now, I want to make sure I don't pick the one that's to the back that's closest to my other branches. I don't want to come up because as these thicken, we want to avoid them being too close or they're going to swell right across from one another. So I'm going to basically probably take this guy, this guy. Okay. So now, so this is essentially what I'm left with day one and then I'm gonna wire it just real quick. Obviously, it's not gonna take very long. <laughs> trim and then wire. Trim and then wire, yeah, that's something I've, I've learned a long time ago is trim and then wire, because if you do it the other way, and actually just for the sake of the demo, maybe I'll take this a little shorter. Yeah, I'm gonna take it a little short. No, I'm not, I'm gonna leave it so. Okay, but I'm gonna show you guys a, a good technique here. So now just doing some 2.0 wire on these guys. They're just thin little branches, so I don't need much. How long do you think you'd let the leader get before coming again? So the a great question. Great question. So realistically, for the highest quality tree, I should not cut that leader until this is almost completely healed. And then I'm continually working the, the wound out. So my next cut, this is maybe a great lesson. So this is going to be my true leader. This is going to be something that's going to one day be cut off. Okay. So this part's going to run, 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 until this heals. Once this is like 90% healed, then we cut to here. And we'll have another big wound, but it'll be smaller. And then we run this guy dun, 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 until that's almost 90% healed. And then we cut that again. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that. You can move your bonsai as fast as you want. But I'm just saying that that is the bar of quality that's set. That's a, a, if you want to build the highest quality trees, then you will heal those wounds before you move to your next section. Because just as I showed you guys in the PowerPoint, if you move to refinement without healing them, it's not going to magically heal. Um, eight years, those haven't really moved much. So it's probably going to be another eight years before those wounds on my tree are fully closed. 
So it's just better to do the heavy lifting when you have all the tools that make it easy than down the road when everything's growing very, very slow. Uh, does that make sense? Or do you think that? All right, cool. I feel like I'm talking to you guys out there. I feel like you're really here. I appreciate every for you guys having me out here, even though it's just a, a virtual session. We've been having some fun playing with some trees around here today. There's a question if you're doing any private studies. Um, today or today? Oh yeah, yeah. We did do a little privates today. Some private um, worked on a what was it? A persimmons? Yeah, never heard of a Texas persimmons. Worked on one of those, and then some trees that I'm much more comfortable with. <laughs> um, some ficus. We repotted, cut back. Oh, oh, for tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, unfortunately, uh, I was trying to set some of that stuff up, but unfortunately this trip, just with the COVID and all that, it didn't pan out um, the way I had planned it. So this time, unfortunately, I am leaving tomorrow at like noon. Um, but I am hoping to, I've talked with Dallas and I've talked with Longview in Texas as well, and they have expressed some interest in possibly having me out later on in the year. So um, there might be a round two where I can come out and, you know, see you guys. We'll see. You'll have to talk with Brandon. He's, he's the man. Mike, someone wants to know if uh, you can make a bald cypress they show him. Have you ever yeah. seen that? Yeah, I've made a bald cypress show him before as well. Um, now, the thing is, is that I wasn't able to, like, get it extremely, extremely ramified. But when I was working with those, I was also much, much earlier in my bonsai career. And I haven't done serious study into them in recent years. But uh, I see no reason why they, they can't be. They have very, very light, very, very easy foliage. Um, it's very small foliage. And uh, they do fine in shohin pots. So I, I don't see why they couldn't make great shohin. Will you let suckers grow around the wound for healing? No, that's, that's exactly what I meant. So, okay, that's great question. Great question. And that's something that uh, used to be kind of uh, a big proponent. People used to say, yeah, definitely let, let things grow around the wound. Just take them off, rub them off, and they'll heal the wound. But that leads to the satellite scars. That leads to like all those little tiny wounds that are all circling around your bigger wound. And um, it's not a better aesthetic than just having the one wound. I'd rather have the one wound than the millions of little tiny ones around it. So, no, the best thing to do, if we're talking sacrifice theory, the best thing to do to heal wounds on the whole trunk is run a branch from the top. So running a branch from the top heals everything under it, every part of the trunk line. So if you have a wound here, down low on the trunk, and you need to heal that, you run it from the top, and it heals the whole trunk line. Um, if you need to thicken a specific branch, or if you don't want to thicken the upper part of your trunk line, then you would run one lower off the trunk, but not directly off the trunk. I don't run this branch out. I wait until I get a secondary off this branch, and I run that out. And I make sure that the branch I'm running is going to stay on the design long term, and it's not going to be cut off the trunk and leaving a big, giant wound. Okay? So, um, no, sacrifices are, are, can be tricky. Uh, but you just want to think, you don't want to create a bigger problem than what you're trying to fix. How long do you think that cut will take to be 90% healed? Well, so these aren't the fastest um, healers, but also, so you've got to think, I would probably need to grow this about five feet tall, I would guess, at least, to heal that wound. So that should tell you something. I'm not going to give you guys a time period because that's not accurate. Because if you're pruning the tree or you're touching the tree or the tree gets weak, then it's gonna take longer time. If I tell you a size that it needs to get to, that'll give you a better idea of what you need to do. So for this wound to heal, this new leader needs to be roughly this big around. Okay, so that would probably need to get to about four or five feet before that's perfectly healed. So what do they do in Japan? Do they just have four or five feet long leaders hanging over? They do. They stake them up and they wait until they're where they need them to be and then they cut them. So um, it's all about efficiency. You, you can cut it and just divide earlier and then rerun, but you're just costing time. You can just get there quicker. Good questions, though. Now we're, now we're warming up. You guys were a little sleepy during the PowerPoint, but now, now we're having some fun.
having some fun. Any other questions out there? What my favorite color is? If someone wanted to know what that first uh, Shari tool you had earlier. But oh, heard. okay, yes, because that is kind of hard to find. So that's called an Abaglen, A-B-L. Oh, God, it's going to be hard to spell. I'm a Bonza guy, not a spelling guy. Um, Abaglen. So it's by a company called File, P-F-E-I-L. And it's they make carving tools. And um, so if you just get close, just get on Google and type Abba Glenn something. Get close to that, and it will bring it up. Um, but it's a really, really good tool. It is a little expensive. I think they run about $40 to $60. Um, so, you know, take care of it. <laughs> Not like mine. This is one from earlier during, uh, during the presentation. Uh, Corey McCarran asks, did you defoliate tropicals before repotting? Yes. Well, so that's, ooh. You, you say that's conflicting info. That is conflicting info. So here we go. Um, yes and no. The idea is not defoliating before repotting. And again, I'm, this, we're going to go on to the why. Okay, I'm not going to go into the, the what. So it's not defoliating before repotting that's important. It's making sure that you're not uh, transpiring too much moisture after you cut roots. So. However many roots I cut down here, especially on undeveloped trees. So this is, we're not talking about refined trees. On this tree here, um, it's fine to defoliate and repot because it's safe. If I don't, if I just leave this full of leaves and I don't defoliate at all, and I cut 30 or 50% of my roots, then this is going to transpire faster than the roots can keep up and it will exert all of the water that's left in the tree. So it's basically just gonna dry itself out. It's no different than if I cut this branch off and I put this on the table, what's gonna happen in two to three hours? You're gonna come back and you're gonna see that it's brown and it's dry and it's desiccated, but why? Why did it get brown, dry, and desiccated? What's the number one reason? What did we change? We cut it off the roots, right? It doesn't have roots. So the same process is happening with the trees. If I don't touch the top, so I'm not saying fully defoliate, but you need to balance. Like you need to pull some leaves or half cut leaves or do something to slow the transpiration from the top to the bottom, okay? So yes, defoliating, it's very, very common in tropical um, teachings and in tropical tree schools to just defoliate the whole tree because it's a no brainer. Uh, you don't have to sit there and say, okay, well I cut 10 roots here, I need to cut 10 leaves here. It's just you defoliate the whole thing, cut as many roots as you want, you're fine. So uh, a lot of times we get into the habit of just defoliating the whole tree, but that has its own cons. Defoliating weak branches just makes them weaker. So if you have a branch that's just barely hanging on on your design and you go and you defoliate it, well, now it's, it's dead. It's definitely dead. So um, yes and no. In bonsai, it's tricky to answer things too definitively because there's usually not blanket answers like that. But great question. Definitely some conflicting advice out there with that. Okay, so now we've just got some wire on here. Half of this stuff isn't even gonna be used, um, but I do wanna talk about it. So first things first, what kind of movement are we gonna put into these branches? I'm not gonna put crazy spirals into these branches. I'm not gonna put crazy S-shaped movement into these branches, but why? Why aren't I doing that? If we look at the trunk, the trunk has very subtle movement. There's not a ton of movement to it. And so again, going back to what I said earlier, whatever environment shapes the trunk shapes the branches. Okay, same thing, same environment. So I need to try and put subtle movement into the branches, just keeping them from being perfectly straight. That's it, okay? That's all I'm trying to do. Now this whole thing is gonna be a sacrifice branch here. This is gonna be our new top. So now ignore this section. Just ignore that long section, and that's essentially how I would start a lot of shohan. I know it's not pretty, I know it's not like the, the transformation, but real shohan in the way that I've gotten to some of the trees you guys have seen, I didn't take that approach of just transformation. Um, I really did have to do a lot of building. I was building my trees the way I wanted to with a lot of forethought and like a plan. So 
Um, so this is kind of how I would leave this. I would put this out on the bench, let these run, and I would reassess it in a couple of months, make sure that I'm checking, because here's the thing. I was talking to Brandon about this, is that development culture, it sounds easy. Oh, I just wire a branch and I just let it run and I'm done. But there's a lot of work that comes in between that point before you finally cut that branch. So it's not as easy as just forgetting, leaving it in the back of the nursery and walking away. So as this gets longer and longer and longer, it's going to pull more and more moisture from this pot. Not only that, but the branches you ran, one of them's going to get too strong probably than the other two, and you're going to notice that these don't grow at all, and this one's grown a ton. And so the last thing you'll notice is that you're starting to grow branches in places you don't want them. And if you don't ever check that, if you just set it aside in the back of the garden for the whole year, then you grow a ton of problems on that design. Or you might even find that a new branch comes out that's not wired and just grows and grows and grows and your wire design didn't do anything because the tree was like, why would I push on that weaker growth when I'll just push this out? So we have to go and we have to maintain our work. And what I'll do if it's growing too long and it's sucking too much water is I defoliate up to the tip. I don't cut the tip, but I pull leaves off to stop water draw. And it looks stupid. I mean, it really does. Your tree will be spaced out and it'll have all this gap here with leaves out on the ends. But it's, it's the function. It's what we're trying to achieve. So the other thing I do is I clean out those unwanted branches in between that time. Like I check them routinely, making sure I'm not growing any issues. Um, and I also make sure that I'm balancing the foliage so that everything is getting and growing vigorously. So I'm not wasting my time. So I don't come back in a year and be like, well, I wired that stuff and it didn't even grow there. So it's, it, the game's not over just because we're not wiring the whole tree and doing that traditional kind of transformation work. So the next tree we'll do is this elm. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. So, what's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. So, uh, very nice Chinese elm. Chinese elm make very nice shohin. Uh, they ramify very, very easily. They're very, very hardy. So this is a great tree to kind of build a, a shohin on. Now, unfortunately, again, we're already way past our height rule. So you guys know what happens, right? We got to wire it down. No, uh, we do have to make, make some cuts on it just to bring it down a little bit. Um, so this is one of the trees where I didn't get a head start to really, really look at it. But, okay, so the first cut, minimum cut. I don't even know if this will do it, but it, let's start benign first and work our way down. Okay, that's our first cut. Let's see how we did. We did pretty good. So technically we're at the top um, echelon of where we could be considered shohin. Okay. So now I do have to make harder cuts though, because we do have sections that are very, very long that aren't tapering. So let me just look at these before I jump the gun and just start hacking up his nice little tree. Eh, actually, it's not as bad as I thought. It's not as bad as I thought. So honestly, because he must be caring for this for a little while. You've had this a little while or have worked on it before? So this tree actually has really, really good taper. I don't think I'm going to have to be as aggressive as I thought. So the only area where I think I'm going to try to rebuild some taper is in this lower portion down here. Try and build this up. Because yeah. again, we not only need to work on the top of the tree, like how tall it is, but this is about feel. So it can't be this wide. Just because it's eight inches tall, it can't then be a football field wide and still be like show him, like look at my show him. It has to be small. It has to feel small. I like to say this, uh, a show him is a one-handed tree. You should easily be able to hold it in one hand. Um, a mame should easily be able to be held in two fingers. Two finger tree, okay? So now we made our initial cut. Just do a little more clean out here. So now Chinese elms are notorious for growing these like whirls if they're left unchecked, these kind of branches just growing in all kind of sections. So if, we, if you guys can see on the detail cam, we've got branches in like a rosette, very, very knobby growth. Um, so we need to get in there and we're going to have to fix that. And usually the answer to fixing that is cutting behind the um, obstruction, kind of cutting behind where it gets ugly. Okay. All right. 
and then I move on. I just start from branch to branch. I just go piece by piece. Take my selection off. Okay. So I'm a big advocate too, like the way I like to build out my shohin trees is um, bifurcation. So I usually go one, to one branch, I grow it out, I cut it back, and I'm only pulling two branches. So I go one to two, then I go two to four, then four to eight, then eight to 16, uh, 16 to 32, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's always doubling. And the problem is, is that you can leave more. So you can go and you can wire out a branch with three. Uh, but what I've noticed is that there's a couple of issues. Is you're always kind of continuing this, this straight line throughout the tree um, instead of getting the division and the change in direction by pruning. Um, uh, and the other issue is that if you run all those three, you usually end up having to come back anyway to cut back harder to get the division you want or to get the taper you want. So I usually only pick two, and then I pass that part of the tree, and I don't have to go back there and fix that for a very, very long time. So I've just found if I just bite the bullet and I cut it back to two branches each time on the section in front, then um, I just build out slower and slower and slower, and by the time I get to a finished design, I don't really have to fix a whole lot, okay? So that's how I like to build my branches. So for those of you who are wondering why he's cutting off things that could be good branches, like this guy here, I was trying to get a good bifurcation from the back of the branch. So instead of having these like four branches right like that coming out of one point, I want it to be two and then four. Okay, or maybe two and then four. Okay. Okay, so as we get higher up into the tree, our ramification is getting a little coarser, so I'm going to have to cut a little harder back. Do we have any questions out there? Everybody doing okay? Okay. That's so far. Someone said just to root that cutting. I, uh, thoughts on that for the Chinese elm? And honest, honestly, I've never been able to root a Chinese elm cutting just the way I normally root cuttings. But I don't, I don't really try to too much with these. Um, but I hear, I mean, I don't, I hear they root just fine. You just stick them in soil and, and they root fine. So um, give it a shot. They're, they're here. <laughs> we're going to do a, yeah, we're going to auction the cuttings off next. That's the next thing. Mike, uh, someone yes. would like to know if you've been successful in getting, uh, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Melina Parrot's Beak yeah. Flower? Uh, yes, absolutely. As bonsai, too. Yeah, so they do. Um, they, it actually, usually they just have to be very, very strong, and they won't flower if you're constantly pruning them. So if they don't have a section to kind of push the, the inflorescence, uh, then it's usually getting pruned off if you're too deep into refinement. So usually when I see the flowering, it's on trees that I'm running branches or trees that haven't been pruned in a while, and uh, usually occurs in deep summer. So we'll see it then. But yeah, I, I see it quite often. Good question. Okay. Ready for another question? I'm ready. Oh. Uh, someone said, please talk about the future care of this tree if I over 90 or high 90 degree temps. Ah, good point. So now my care for this is anytime you cut a tree back hard, it's all about the aftercare. So now this tree has to be nursed back to health. So what I mean by that is my watering is cut in two thirds, like more than half. What this tree, whatever it needed today before we cut it, if it needed to be watered every day, it's now gonna need two thirds less of that. Um, so that's the first and foremost thing that I would do differently caring for this this time of year is I would watch that it doesn't stay too wet until it re recovers some of its foliage uh, because the foliage helps it use water. 
So right now is a very critical time not to overwater it. Because it doesn't have leaves, I wouldn't put it in the shade too much. In Florida, we grow these in full sun and we have like the highest UV index in the country. So I'm not putting these guys in the shade um, until I go into a show hen pot. So once I go into a show hen pot, the, the need for this horticulture to actually, the need for this to stay wet becomes paramount over its need to need more sun. So right now in this giant nursery soil, I would water it light, keep it in full sun, uh, and let it recover. Once it recovers, then I would start making my next move. But yeah, whoever asked that question, you're right. This is a point where it is kind of very critical that good aftercare is followed. This obviously also is not the best time to be working Chinese elms. That's something I, I meant to touch on and I didn't get to touch on it. So we're working on it because this is when I'm here, you know, um, this is when we're having the program. And this is probably one of the better trees that, out of the garden that I saw back there to kind of work on and still come back. That being said, uh, if I was at home and we had all the time in the world to plan this, we would probably do this work earlier in the spring, you know, this heavy, heavy work. Um, and, uh, and then kind of let it recover and do more of the refinement work or more of the development work through the grow season. But it is what it is, so it should recover fine. We do work on Chinese elms almost year round in Florida because we do have a lot of beginners and that's a tree that is heavily pushed on them. So um, they will take it, they will handle it. It doesn't mean it's the best technique. So just because you see that we're working elms here in summer doesn't mean that you should go hard cut your Chinese elm in the middle of summer, okay? So I hope that helps. Just real quick wiring. Now, one thing I'd like to do that I'm still debating is cutting this last section back a little bit more. And I think I'm going to do it. So I am going to cut this last section back a little bit more just to increase the movement of my trunk. Okay. So now you guys see my final height is definitely within the show hint and it gives me room to build ramification. So that's the other thing. You can't just cut your trunk line to eight inches and say, okay, uh, I'm set up to make a show hen. You actually have to go under and account for the room you're gonna need to build outward, okay? So now I'm just gonna wire like three branches. Got, that's pretty heavy, so is that. That's good. Any questions out there? What's the best restaurant to eat at in Austin? I'm going to ask you guys a question. No, 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 no. Okay. You can ask them. Sure. Uh, someone wanted to know what tropicals would you not defoliate? I believe was the question. Yeah, what species should we not defoliate with tropicals? Whew. Um, that's, that's a tough question. Um, hmm. That's kind of loaded. I'm trying to think of even one that I wouldn't ever, ever defoliate. Honestly, I don't think there's, I can't really think of one tropical tree that can't handle defoliating. Um, one tree that I don't defoliate a lot is buttonwoods. I will only defoliate them in specific situations. Um, what else? Oh, you guys got me. You guys stuck me right, right there. I'm trying to think. It'll come to me as I'm working. I'm going to think about that more. So I'm not, not moving on 100% from that comment. But I can't think of a tropical that's 100% no-no for defoliating. It's usually more of the subtropical plants that we work with that we're very apprehensive about full defoliation. But even like jades, even our succulents, um, people fully defoliate those down in the tropics. So they're not worried about it. Cool. He said, after cleaning up the chop, how close was it to the top branch? Did you leave enough or carve it more naturally? No, um, no. I, it's basically, I should have got a little closer view. So once you have a good branch at the top of the wound, so like here, I have this branch and I have this wound here. This wound should be cut flush to that branch and slightly concaved. Flush to that branch, meaning no, no raise, no lip, no nothing. Because you need, and uh, we were talking about this earlier, is you need to, every time you cut, hard cut, you have to go back once the branches have grown and recut so that your branch is right up next to that wound. Otherwise, you'll never heal that wound. 
if there's any kind of lip on it whatsoever, you're adding time that the, the cambium has to crawl over that lip and then back down into the divot. So once the branch is strong enough, I don't do it when the branches are little tiny hairs, because then I run the risk of hurting the branch or damaging um, the way they're feeding. So I wait until they get about this long. Once they're about three inches, four inches long, I'll go in and I'll recut as close to those branches as I can, okay? And that will maximize your healing. Otherwise, don't wait too long because if you wait till the branches are too long, then you go and you make your cut, you could have used those elongating branches to heal that wound. So if you've grown branches this big and you're just now cutting your second chop to clean the wound, you just wasted all that potential energy to heal that wound on nothing. Okay, does that make sense? So it's all, it's all just uh, balancing the vigor of the tree. Okay. So I've been looking at this tree for a while. What do you think about removing that and going for just like the two lower branches? This one? Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, you could do that too. Um, you could absolutely take it down even lower and go there. But we've hit that, that mark, so this is probably the smallest you could go, or the largest you could go and still have it be a shohin. So that's really what I was illustrating. Like you could still make a great tree because you see we still have good movement into this. Mm -hmm. So you could still make a nice shohin into there, but you'll have stronger taper and stronger proportions here. So I personally, I, for, because it's not my tree and, and it, it'll give them the most to look at, I leave it a little long, a little more robust. But you could definitely reduce it another, another section. It wouldn't be wrong. Cool. Yeah. It, let me rephrase that. It might even be more exciting. It might be easier to make that tree exciting because it's so small. You see what I'm saying? Like the proportions will be more exaggerated. So then this guy. Any any questions? Quiet night. Everybody's going to bed, I think. Nobody answered my Austin question about restaurants. We did get one feedback. Someone said to go to Matt's El Rancho. Ooh, Matt's El Rancho. What do you like to eat? I like everything. Somebody told me to go to Franklin's. <laughs> Somebody told me at Franklin's, yeah. Somebody was like, you have to go to Franklin's. It's usually like a five-hour wait, but now you oh, can just like call it in and dance. Is it really a five-hour wait? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what, man. I, we yeah, did I get to go to Torchy's. I did get to go to Torchy's, which was uh, recommended to me. So I hit one of my recommendations. I'm pretty happy. We have another tropical question? Sure. So I don't, I don't put in shade after I defoliate. I only put in shade if I repot. So if I defoliate and I'm not repotting, then I'll just leave it in full sun. Um, what was the other part to that question? She asked, with our healthy tropicals, when can we defoliate and how often? Okay, so you can defoliate your healthy tropicals as soon as you kind of enter the growing season. So as soon as temperatures have kind of stabilized, or even, you can even do that a little earlier if you're willing to provide the tree um, the carrot needs. So like if you guys get a cold snap, you bring the tree indoors. Um, you could probably start doing those here in Texas, probably April. You know, you could probably start doing your defoliations and just watch the weather um, on most of your tropicals, except for buttonwoods, premnas, and melinas, and like hard, hard tropicals. So anything that's a, a hard, hard tropical, you want to make sure that you pot in your hottest time of year, okay? Uh, Melinas, Premnas, they do best when you guys are really, really hot. So I do in Florida tend to do them in April, but we've been getting hotter and hotter every year. Um, and these are also established trees. So not established trees, I'd probably wait um, until you're at the hottest point. Established trees, you can always push a little bit more. So as long as you're warm and happy, uh, feel free to defoliate the trees. Now the amount of times, that's a, that's a good question. Um, 
basically you can do it as many times as the tree will allow you. And I know that's kind of a cop-out answer, but it's true. Not every tree will allow you to defoliate four times in a year. A sea hibiscus definitely will. Uh, you can re defoliate that probably four or five times a year and be fine. Things like ficus nerifolia, I usually only do once a year. Buttonwoods, once a year. Um, so anything that is even remotely touchy, I try to do once a year and then do a partial defoliation. So there's a big uh, difference between a full defoliation and what that achieves and a partial defoliation. So a partial defoliation is very, very important and we do that more often throughout the year because that weakens strong growth and uh, strengthens weak growth. So what a partial defoliation entails is basically you go through the tree and you defoliate the strongest areas the most. The medium areas you defoliate a little bit and the weak, weak areas you don't touch at all. And so that balances your vigor, okay? That's a partial defoliation. You might do that three times a year on some tropicals and do one hard defoliation. So you've just got to read the vigor of the tree because the idea of defoliation, what we're accomplishing on a full defoliation is weakening the growth. We're trying to weaken the tree and get it to push us smaller leaf sets, smaller leaves, smaller branches, slower, finer growth. So the whole idea is behind weakening that tree. So with care though, I hope that helped. So this one's kind of done, just got its initial shape cleaned out and ready to kind of get the next stage. So what I do now is just wait till it buds out. And then once it buds out and starts pushing branches, I'll go through and I'll look at those branches again. And any that are going to be useful to design, I will add to the design and move on from that point. So you'll repeat that until you get to the results you want. Um, once you get to the appropriate time of year, I'd also immediately start potting it over to bonsai soil, even if you're not going to put it in a bonsai pot, okay? So, whoop, whoop, whoop. Nice. What would you like next? Um, let's do the Premna. Yeah, that one's good. Okay. So Premna, Premna, Premna. So this is something that one of my favorite trees to grow. I have two, two passions, I'd say, that are like my primary uh, trees that I grow. And that is Premna and Sea Hibiscus. Those are the things I spend my most time on. Um, Premna is my absolute favorite. It was something that when I first got into bonsai, it was this like mythical unicorn of a tree that... I, I saw in books, I read about all the time, I, I drooled over, and we never had them in the United States. Um, same with sea hibiscus, and same with, um, there was another tree that I'm not remembering. But these were trees that we'd always see in books and just kind of fantasized about. And then uh, at one point, I think Pedro Morales was the guy who came back from Taiwan, and he had uh, gotten some Premna bonsai from there. And so he had given us a cutting, and that kind of started it all from that point. We started growing Premna in the nursery, and within four years, we started having sizable Premna to work with, and it quickly became like my favorite species to work. Why I like it so much is the versatility of it. So this tree will reduce its leaves to the size of a rice grain with nothing more than just refinement pruning, just pruning, 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 and you'll get those leaves smaller, smaller, smaller. Um, the other thing is they ramify branches incredibly easy and incredibly densely. So you can get amazing, amazing ramification. The third thing is they hold deadwood uh, and it can be preserved and you can do deadwood designs if you like. Same with like what I was showing with the buttonwood, the shari designs. Uh, and the last thing, propagation and, um, and development time. They're extremely fast to develop trees, extremely fast to develop roots. Uh, propagation is extremely easy and so you can continually learn on this material and everything you cut off just root. So the reason I'm prefacing that is that we are gonna cut off a lot of this stuff and if this was my tree, I would waste none of this growth and I would actually use the cuttings more so than I would the main tree. A lot of times I've bought Premna from the nursery and had more fun with some of the cuttings than I did with the main trunk line. So that's gonna be kind of what we look at here, one of the things on top of uh, our trunk line that we have already. So, Premna microphylla is a hard tropical. They stem from Southeast Asia. Usually they're grown in places like Malaysia, Taiwan, um, Philippines, Indonesia. Uh, there is a Japanese version called the Japanese Premna, Premna japonica. 
uh, has a slightly different leaf and is also known as the skunk maple. So, are we doing? Oh, hey, you got words on it. That's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna first just start making some hard cuts, and then we'll talk about what we're doing. So we've got a lot of long, very very straight, untapering branches, and not only that, our tree is way 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 too big for show hen. So we need to start looking at how we're going to build taper into this design. And I've already kind of located it, I think. So we're going to start just hard cuts first, get rid of some of the bulk of this stuff. Cutting. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, another big one. So the reason I'm cutting these guys is they're long and straight. So a rule that that this was super helpful when I first started doing bonsai that helped me kind of work through trees was I used to ask Eric, you know, how do you know where to cut a tree? Like, how do you just look at a tree and you know exactly where to cut it? And the rule he gave me that stuck with me forever was you look at a tree and you follow the trunk line and wherever that tree starts to lack either movement or taper, you make the cut. So if you're following this trunk line all the way up and it has nice movement and it's curving and everything, it's fine and then it's still tapering, it's fine. But the second you get to a section like this, where we're tapering, we're tapering, we're tapering, well now we don't taper from here to here. It's nothing, it's just straight. No interest of any kind. So to simplify that even more, it's boring. It doesn't have any twist, doesn't have any turn, doesn't have any taper. So at the point where we lose the last bit of taper, that's where I make my cut. So if we're following this out, it's tapering, tapering, tapering right there. It stops tapering, so that's where I make my cut. So when I buy a tree, an important distinction that's a little different than other people is I don't care about the branches. I don't buy it for this. I don't buy it to prune it into a ball. Um, I don't care about any of that. So all this stuff is expendable. I'm looking at the bones and I'm looking at the corrections I'm going to need to make to the bones to get to the tree I want. Uh, and I don't fix flaws out here first. I fix the flaws here at the trunk first, day one because that first initial, we're never gonna have to be this aggressive again, never. I'm never gonna have to come in and cut this tree the way I'm cutting it today. But if you don't do this today, then you will. You'll, you'll notice years down the road, you'll be like, oh, it's still a problem, and then you'll finally have to cut it, and all the work that you've put onto it goes with it. So bite the bullet early on, just do your big cuts, and move on from that point, and never go there again. Uh, that's my best advice. So now we kinda, have, we're getting there. We can kind of see that we're honing in on a central trunk line, and I'll talk more about what I'm looking for here in a minute. Okay. Do we have any questions out there? You guys just watching? Defoli, a Delonix, a loyal Poinciana. Yeah. Uh, she said you got one for Wiggers, and the compound leaves are huge. Sure. Yeah, defoliate it. Now, the, the Poinciana are not the easiest subject to make, like, fine ramified bonsai with. They, they do make pretty trees, pretty uh, bonsai trees, but they can be very difficult to reduce the leaf and to get them uh, compact. So don't be alarmed if you defoliate it and they come back and they're, like, marginally smaller, okay? All right, so these cuttings, this is kind of the stuff that I, I go goo goo gaga over, okay? Because the way I would kind of prep these for growing is like this. And this sounds, you're gonna laugh when I show you this, but this is like a, a money tree in the making. This little movement to that cutting, that little lightning bolt, in one year will be very, very usable. I can turn that into an exposed root. I can turn that into a small show hen, work on the nabari. I've already got great movement to it, and so that, I'd pot that up and I'd be fine. Now, you don't only have to do small cuttings. If I had found, which I didn't, but if I had found a really cool, like fatter piece that maybe had some fluting or some character, I can root that too. And one of my most famous premna that a lot of you guys have probably seen was a cutting off a bigger tree. It was just something that I took off a bigger tree and, uh, and put some time into working on it, and it turned into a very, very nice premna show hint. So the cuttings, I grow more of my Premna Shohin from cuttings 
than I do from actual stock. Um, I, what I usually do with the stock, like the other very famous Premna I have uh, that you guys probably know about, is the one that's kind of like a little sumo guy. And I basically save that much of my Premna. I just cut it back like that. I found one with a cool wide base, and I cut it back and regrew it. So um, don't be afraid to be aggressive, especially on tropicals, because if you're not going to be aggressive on your tropicals, what are you going to be aggressive on, right? You know, they grow faster than anything else. Does he have a common name? Sorry, I don't mean to make you like ping pong back with him, but if there's a common name, I haven't heard that name, Decelium. Cool. Said vintage jade. Vintage jade. I haven't. I honestly have not seen that, so I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look. I wonder if he means like just like the standard jade. Uh, I do work a lot with the Portulacaria Afra, like the the dwarf jade, but I haven't worked with the other one. I'm going to actually take this big stub back a little further because it is still ugly. And so again, I'm not, I'm not trying to focus on what I have here today. I'm not trying to do this like transformation game. I'm trying to set this up to be the most successful shohin that I can. And uh, so being aggressive early on is going to definitely benefit us. And cutting these stubs back allows them to be beds for secondary branches. So we'll be able to build movement off of these branch stubs and have a good transition from like fat to young. So what I mean by that, I'll show you guys with like a cut off branch because it'll make more sense, is my next thing that I'm going to do on this shohin is grow out branches off of these stubs to start transitioning in taper. So I'm going to be bringing it in like that. So even this branch is probably a little long, and I'm probably going to cut him back too, a little more. And then just wire a few of these branches. Nothing crazy. OK, I need the light wire. Light wire. Mm. I don't know on that 2.0. I appreciate all the questions. Now there are kind of like a list, uh, there are a bunch of Shohin trees that are kind of considered more traditional. Like you can go and look at, at the Gafu 10 um, shows and you'll notice that there are very traditional species that they use in Japan, Iliagnus, Gardenia, um, are some other ones? Obviously, azalea. Um, things you wouldn't recommend for showing? Yes, there's like so many. There's so many things that I wouldn't recommend. Um, I see people try them, like the common. No, I mean, basically things that are going to have coarse growth, coarse internodes, and big leaves. You're you're not going to, unless you know, and somebody has worked with it and fixed it it's probably not going to be worth your time and effort. So unless you want to be a pioneer and you're going and you're like hunting down new material that nobody's worked with, nine out of ten times that like long course growth um, is not going to make a good show and it's going to be aggravating to work with. Uh, there's plenty of trees like True Banyan is a great great example. Let's just start there. Tons of ficus that are great for bonsai, tons of them that make banyan trees except the banyan tree. The banyan tree makes the worst banyan of all the banyan trees. Um, and it has a large, large leaf, coarse internode, and it's prone to die back when you prune it. So these are all attributes that don't lend themselves well for bonsai. So if you want to like beat your head against the wall, go for it. But 
It's just that it's not that you can't do it. It's just some juice isn't worth the squeeze. You know, there's some, it's not worth it. You can put that time into another tree and be leaps and bounds further. So things like that, coarse growth, like I'm trying to think of another tree that springs to mind. We have one called carrot wood. Don't work on carrot wood. <laughs> Yeah. Benjamina, that's another one. Those can make fine bonsai, fine bonsai. But they're a pain. They're a pain in the butt. They're they're finicky. They uh, you know they have prone to die back. They can be tricky to get fine fine growth. So some juice isn't worth the squeeze. If I a hundred out of hundred times, I would take a tiger bark ficus over a, a Benjamina ficus. A hundred out of a hundred times. Someone wants to know, in your opinion, what is the best species for Shohin Banyan? For Shohin Banyan? Uh, Banyan? Banyan? Yeah. Oh, ooh, ooh. tiger bark. Um, tiger bark, so you can even get smaller leafed ficus, okay? You can get melon seed ficus, and you can get Burt Davii nana, and you can get things that have smaller leaves, but the tiger bark is just the boss. It reduces the leaves the best while still maintaining good color. You can do real techniques with it. Um, they reduce leaves very, very fine. So tiger bark, just standard tiger bark, you can get reduced down to melon seed size just with work, and they they don't look that they don't look yellow, they don't look malformed, they just look healthier and stronger, and more vigorous. Um, they drop arrow roots readily. They're they're just my my favorite ficus to really work on. Uh, so for banyan, they they're really really good. Uh, Another great one is Green Island Ficus. We're going to talk about it. Can I just see that quick? This is one. This might even be better for specifically Banyan. This might even be better than Tiger Bark. This is Green Island Ficus. So they're all in the same family. They're all Ficus microcarpa. Um, but this is one called Green Island. And this probably has a propensity to drop even more aerial roots even easier. So this one, in my opinion, probably is the best for aerial root style Banyan. Uh, but my, still, my favorite ficus period is tiger bark. It's it's just the best ficus. Don't take my word for it. Try one. Okay. All right, two more branches, guys, and then we'll move on. Got a couple more tree. Well, what? One more? Two more? Two more trees? And, you, and then you guys can go to bed, or meet us out at. Um, what was it called? Franklin's. Franklin's. Yeah, party at Franklin's. Also got a message on the Facebook saying that you're a vegan. That I'm a vegan? Yeah. I'm not a vegan. <laughs> no. Uh, I guess they were trolling. Who's, they, they, I have a lot of trolls on my page. Look out. Don't trust anyone. Not that there's anything wrong with being vegan. I'm just person. I'm just not. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I got to find out who said that. Oh, I can't yeah. wait. Satoyama? Yeah. That's Vince. That's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thanks, Vince. All right, one last branch. Last one. Now, I am wiring a little light. Uh, I am I'm trying to save the last little bit of 2.0 for our next two projects, so I'm wearing a little bit light with this stuff, but... Oh, thank you. Sorry. So how about uh, feminism or healing to the abilities of the well good, so good question too. Okay, so the question is how do Premnus heal over? They're not the best healer. They're also not the worst healer. So I'd put them somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, you're not going to see as much healing as you would on like a tiger bark with the same amount of branch growth. So you'll probably have to run a Premna longer and um, longer, well, longer and f uh, bigger to get the same amount of healing. But uh, they can still roll over wounds just, just fine. Um, but they do take a little while longer. So that part's not my favorite. If I could give them one ding, that would be one ding. So it's a 9 out of 10. 
but still really, really great trees. So for that back lower branch that you're just cleaning with the palm paper, like what's your expectation and anticipation for what that branch is? This guy or th this the guy? Other one that you, yeah. Oh, so I'm actually probably going to make my front somewhere in there. I'm going to try and actually pull off something like that. So then we'll have this moving trunk line in here. You might see it better from the back. So you'll see there's like some movement into that trunk line. And then I'm hoping I get another break in this flat section. So I'm still hoping to chop that again once that kind of pops out. And then I'll finally have a good taper ratio. But each one of these stubs that I left, so the reason I leave these stubs is that I'm in theory I've left a couple of inner nodes where I've cut back. And so they're going to give me new branches. And those are going to grow off of these already fat sections. So if, if you've been following along and I've been talking about growing these big branches first and then cutting them back and dividing them, well, we've already done the first step without paying attention. Like This has already run out. It's already gotten fat. So it's ready to divide to the next taper section, which means I would cut it back and wait to get, well, my hand's in the way, wait to get another branch there. So you see that branch comes there. It's much easier to wire. I get a better taper ratio, so it goes from fat to skinny, and I continue building out the tree. Does that? I hope that makes sense. So the same thing for all of these stubs, even this little stub to the back. I'm hoping that I get one or two buds that come off of it, and then I'm going to recut to the new bud and get a better transition for taper. So it's, it's a process, you know, but remember that this is the hardest it's going to get. This is the most aggressive I'm going to be. Once I push past this point, I'm going to be working out to here, and then be working out to here, and then be working out to here. Okay, so it's uh, just the first part. Got to just bite the bullet. So these branches I'm wiring here aren't even going to be useful in the final design. I'm just leaving them as backups and just as like a proof of concept, just kind of give you an idea of where things go. So realistically, this tree, this is not where I would want the apex. I would want the apex to break right here. So I'd like the apex to break somewhere back in there, closer, further in, and so that we don't have, again, a longer non-tapering section, okay? So the Premna also always start looking uglier first. So they always, we always got to take a few steps back. But um, for any of you guys who are interested in seeing some Premna work, you can go check out my Facebook or my Instagram. And I will also this year be sharing a bunch of progressions because I've been doing a lot of Premna work for clubs. Um, so I have some really nice progressions that will be coming out this year. Okay, last thing I'm gonna do is just adjust these wounds one more time, just make sure they're right where they need to be and paste them. And then the species, do they have fusion or grafting capabilities? Grafting, yes, fusion, no. So fusion um, will work on some species. Some, once they pass a certain age, they won't ever fuse barks together. So think of like, a, you ever seen braided trees? And you notice how some braided trees, they're distinctly, even though they've been braided for years, you still see that they're two trunks, right? They've never fused and you, it never disappears. Whereas if you braid a ficus, eventually that ficus braid is just gonna turn into one big root, you know, or one big trunk. So, um, I don't think these, I haven't tried fusing them extremely young. Like I, I'd assume small guys like that could maybe fuse. Um, but once they start getting a bark on the outside of them, they won't fuse. Building trees, that's all we're doing, we're just building. It's like build a bear, but build a tree. Okay. Okay. All right, so again, nothing too, too crazy. We're gonna do another reduction once it pushes out, but that's as far as I go today. I just get it to a trunk line, wire out what I can, and then I'm waiting for everything to push off of the structure that I've set here now. So that one's good to go. CI biscuits, sir. Sure, we'll do the CI biscuits. This one will be fun. Thanks, man. I'll get this stuff out of the way. Okay. 
All right, now this one should be fun. This is another one of my pa passion trees. I love, love, love sea hibiscus. I grow tons of them. This is the tree that if you ever wanted to learn um, like good development techniques or grafting or anything difficult that you've maybe been scared of learning, this is the tree to kind of try things on. They, they heal extremely rapidly. Um, they take grafts, grafts very, very easily. They grow extremely fast. This is the fastest thing I've found in bonsai culture so far. I haven't found anything that grows faster than this in development as far as thickening and healing wounds, nothing. So this is the number one. So if you wanted to work with that theory of, I wanna try healing wounds, this will teach you that concept faster than anything else, okay? Um, they, uh, you can do all sorts of grafting, which is what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna show you guys a couple of easy grafts that I've been working on the last few months um, that really have sped along the development of these trees. So before we do the grafts though, we have to do something pretty scary, okay? So again, show him. We need to be somewhere in that realm, all while tapering up. And so for those of you out there, if you can see, where does this tree start to taper? The answer is it doesn't <laughs> anywhere. No, it tapers from here and then it stops right here. There's no taper above that line. So what do we do? Um, and cutting it's not the only answer. Cutting it's just the easy answer. So we could run this tree out and make a more delicate tree and ramify it and try to play with a much longer taper ratio, like a 12 to one but that's a harder tree to make impactful and that's a harder tree to really flesh out and, and make into a really cool tree. It's not saying that you can't do it, it's just gonna be harder. It may or may not work on, on the tree you're working on. Following on good taper ratios like a six to one or trying to keep things nice and tight and compact is an easy way to routinely formulaically make impactful trees, okay? So I usually, especially if I'm just doing teaching work, I usually try to just maintain to wherever it starts lacking taper, we make our cut, we build our next transition. So no different here, just because we're lacking branches. So I'm going to go here. Okay, now let me just reposition. Got to get my fat hand on there. There we go. Timber. Okay, so we're not done with this though. If this was at my house, the next thing I would do is everything I cut off of here, I would also wire, or I would also root and wire. So everything on here, I'd root and get wired. Okay, every single one of these. But we're gonna do a little something different today and we're gonna make graphs and we're gonna put in a couple of graphs just to make sure that we have a step ahead of the game. You don't have to graph these. It's not the only thing, only way to kind of get them to bud back, obviously. But what grafting does, and um, what's very, very useful, is in development, when we run things long, our inner nodes stretch. So the, the node between buds gets longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. And that means when you cut on old material, you might not know that you're hitting the inner node exactly, which means if you cut too high, you may bud out higher than you wanted. You may butt out uh, right on an inner node that you didn't cut under. If you cut too low, it can die back further than you assumed it would. So you might have said, okay, I want my top right here, and you cut there, and the inner node's under it, and you might not get your top there. Now your top's underneath that point. Okay, that's the guessing game of cutting things back. Grafting eliminates the guessing game. There's no more guessing game. If I don't have a bud there, I put a bud there. If I don't have a branch there, I'm not going to get one, I put a branch there. I make sure I'm going to get one. So that's kind of the difference uh, between grafting and just waiting for it to bud out. So I'm gonna just get a few grafts here prepped. I'm not gonna go too crazy on this. I might just put in like two, two veneer grafts on the side. Let's see here, I wanna find nice, nice grafts. 
Okay, and I'll talk about how I prep these and what I'm looking for. Okay, that's a good graph too. Okay, so you can graft any size branch. It doesn't have to be um, a big branch. It doesn't have to be a really, really little branch. I usually like to pull semi-woody branches with um, tight inner nodes. Okay, pull that off like that. Cut that straight, cut that. Okay, so the first thing I do is I defoliate the branch. That's one there. So you guys see that's one graft ready to go. And then this is going to be our other graft. So I'm going to make sure I cut that like that. Cut this like this. Cut this like this. Cut this like this. Cut this like this. Okay. Okay, I got my two grafts. Now I need this. Okay, the next thing is grafting tape, or even better, this stuff's called parafilm tape. And parafilm tape is like, a, it allows sunlight and air well, not air, but sunlight to get through the graft and allows it to bud out behind it. And so when you wrap it with this, you can seal the moisture into the cutting so that it doesn't dry out, which is what we're trying to do. But it also allows sunlight to pass through so that it can bud out. So as you'll see, it's like a very thin film made out of parafilm. So it's like a waxy type of substance. And it doesn't stick to itself right away, but as you stretch it, it starts to stick to themselves. So I'm just slowly rolling it up the graft, making sure I cover this entire graft with parafilm. Okay. And I'll show you guys in a second. It's hard for me to do it and show you what my hands are doing. So maybe I'll fold it down like this so you guys can see there. So you see I'm slowly stretching. I, ideally, I want to get it as thin as I can get it. There we go. Now I'm coming to the terminal bud. Now the terminal bud is important. You don't have to have a terminal bud when grafting, but it's the strongest bud on the branch. And so having it will definitely speed up your branch taking. So see, I encapsulate that entire bud like that. I pull it and then I make sure that it spins like that. Okay. And see, I've got my graft ready. So now it's ready. All right. One graft ready, so I'm not ready to put it in yet. I'm gonna prep my other graft, and I might even find a better one because I'm not super happy with that graft I have picked. Okay. All right, here we go, got a better one. I appreciate you guys being patient out there and tuning in with us and staying tuned in with us. This is good stuff. Okay, so again, I'm wrapping this guy up. Uh-oh. <laughs> the, the camera guys are getting, getting rambunctious. So again, you don't have to use parafilm. Another common uh, method of doing grafting is the baggy technique. So people use baggies with little bits of sphagnum moss in there. Uh, but the, again, it's the why and not the how. You're trying to keep moisture in the cutting while it takes to the parent plant. So the other important thing to, to keep in mind is that cuttings take or grafts take best on tropicals when the tree is like weakened or defoliated where basically where the tree doesn't have much choice but to really push into the graft. So usually I'll defoliate or cut back. Okay, so now my two grafts are ready. See, they're both like that. And if I was doing more grafts than that, I'd get them all prepped as well. So now I assess where the front of my tree is going to be. I think that's going to be the front there. I like that better than that opening there. I'm going to keep this as a side branch. And I'm also going to allow some branches to bud out from the top if they do, which they should. But in the meantime, just in case, I am going to prep these um, grafts. So this is where your X-Acto knife or grafting knife comes into play. Okay, so now what we're doing, you guys can see it's not a super tiny wedge. We're cutting a deep wedge in there. You see how I'm prying it out like that? 
So we cut a deep wedge. We wanna make sure we get into the cambium layer like that. So now I'm gonna pull the knife out and let you guys see what we made. So you see we made a deep slit like that. Now I come to the graft and I've gotta cut the scion uh, to fit in that spot. So I wanna make sure I think about this first, okay? So now I cut from the top first. Cut from the back side next. Okay, it's looking pretty good. Okay, so now you guys can see my graft. Okay, it is cut. I wanna make sure that it's not too long for the channel, so I might actually just trim a bit of that off the end. Okay, so now I take my knife, I stick it back into the channel, I pry it open, and I slide my graft in. Okay, so my graft is now in that side of the plant. Now I'm gonna do one more before I finally um, finish up. I don't wanna put it exactly to the other side. I wanna make sure it's maybe a little lower, so I might even put it a little bit to the back. Okay, again, pry that out. Find my graft that I lost, there it is. So again, I'm going to make sure I'm putting this in the right way and it's not going to look weird. Don't like that way, I like that way. Okay, cut the top. Cut the bottom. And branches that have movement to them are obviously harder to use for graphs than straighter ones, but you can still use them. So you see second graft is prepped. So now I'm gonna go in like that. So get my knife back in there and spread it out. Okay. Okay, so you see our grafts are now in the tree. I could, if I really wanted to get crazy, put one in the top, but I don't wanna split that just yet. I figure we'll just paste that and, um, and you can see how these veneers do. So now this is important too. The, the next thing we have to do is paste around this wound and you don't have to paste it, you could just tape it, but I found that especially with sea hibiscus, the paste really seems to um, spark that rollover and really helps. So Lauren McCullen asks, can you, can you graph off another sea hibiscus? Yeah, absolutely. So that's actually that's actually a great question because a lot of the best trees in tropical bonsai are built uh, by taking like smaller leaved sea hibiscus. They they basically find a variety that maybe has tight inner nodes or small better growth, and they graft that to bigger trunks. So you might find um, a better foliage or something, and they'll use grafting to kind of switch out the foliage. But the other reason, even aside from that, the the, the benefits of grafting are just placing branches exactly where you want them. It's no longer a guessing game. So all the, every time we cut, we're always guessing where it's gonna bud back. You know, we do an educated guess. We say, okay, we got inner nodes there, it should bud there. But grafting ensures that you just have the next branches. So in tropical bonsai in places like Taiwan, they grow out these big trees and what they do when they're ready to make their next branch set, so instead of cutting it back and just waiting for it to bud out, they cut the whole tree back completely, every leaf off of it and then they graft onto every single branch that's on there, and they graft all their side branches on. And so they basically do all the work that they needed to do that they were gonna leave up to the tree, and they just get it all done, like a formula, done. So, um, so grafting is very, very useful for that aspect. So I have one more little section to do here, and then we're gonna do the last part. I might even just do a I might even just do one more. Hmm. I'm gonna do one more. Okay, so now I'm gonna do what's called a, um, a cleft graft. The last two I did was called a veneer graft. This one's gonna be a cleft graft. 
This one's a little harder to do on big trunks like this because I have to, uh, it's hard to pry out and get the graft in there. So I have to actually cut like a little bit of a, of a channel. Do we have any questions from out there? Everybody doing good? Yeah, Jacob wants to know um, how small can you reduce the leaves on the sea edges? Um, probably real like uh, for some of the best ones down to like a dime. You know, you might be able to get it a little smaller than that. But dime is like is what everybody's really after is getting them down to a dime. Um, in common, like just common pruning, just without doing anything crazy, they will readily reduce to like a silver dollar. You know, like this guy, probably like a silver dollar like that. Um, but if you want really small leaves, it's going to be a lot of work because these. These don't give their best characteristics without you doing the work. You can't like just prune it and make a cool tree. If you just buy a sea hibiscus and you just try to like prune it like you would a premna or a boxwood, it'll just look kind of lame for years and years and years. It has to be kind of built. It has to be built step by step. Okay, so I'm just clearing out the area I want to graft. So now do one more graft. I'm going to make one more graft just so we have one for the top. And then we'll just uh, paste everything and then move on to the final tree. Oh, I'm running low. I'm running low on really good graft. This one. Here we go. Got it. So see, this time I'm going to do a really, really teeny one. Really, 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 really teeny. Everybody, and everybody doing all right? Yeah, tell my trolls they're not allowed to ask any more questions. It's weird, I lose some of the comments because I don't know why. That's right. If, if anybody's comment got missed, or um, I am going to try to go through them uh, in my free time and, and take a look and see if there was anything missed, and I'll try and answer anything that maybe we didn't get to um, here. So this graph needs to be pretty thin because we are going into a very, very tight little area there. Okay. Okay. So you guys can see just at the front of that graph there, I don't know if you can see up close. Is it a little, a little, is it good? So you see it kind of fits in like a puzzle piece. Like I cut the scion, it fits in like a little puzzle. And now I'm going to paste this part here. And now the last part is just the taping to just seal everything up. Because one thing with veneer grass, especially, you cut that flap. And if you don't paste that flap hard, it will just open up and it'll get wider than you want. So then I just take my parafilm. And I make sure that I paste those clefts very, very tightly closed. Again. 
But see, that's kind of a fun technique, you know, and it can definitely open up a whole new world of trees for you and possibilities for you. I have a question from Alexander. Sure. Uh, can the top be shaped and rooted? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's the other thing. That's why no um, work should be wasted in a perfect world. So what I like to do at home, the way I build my sea hibiscus is everything on the tree, I wire. I wire it all. Even if I know I'm cutting it off, and that sounds counterintuitive, but I wire, I twist it, I wire, I put movement, twist, wire, movement, and that way when I cut it off, all I have to do is root it, and I've already got a wired cutting, already rooted and wired. So I'm, I'm always trying to, to think ahead and think how I can save time, save work, and not just waste it by cutting it off. So um, if there's something cool that I can air layer off, I'll air layer it off. Um, so things like that. Okay, so we're almost done with the sea hibiscus. I just have to paste this top, but just to give you guys an update on how we're looking. Let me just defoliate this so you can see a little better. Okay. So that's kind of where we're leaving off. So nothing too crazy. It doesn't look beautiful today. We're just putting branches where we need them to be and just building a small trunk, okay? So it's not like this isn't the transformation game where I then wire it out and position everything. Unfortunately, with Shohin, we don't have that luxury. We don't have a million branches right where we need them to build out a tree. So we have to, there are no, cap, no shortcuts. We have to just build it. So same with the cut paste, I like to put on the cleanest layer I can. Ideally, I want it to be just thin enough or just thick enough to cover the wound. I don't need to put like a three inch thick layer of cut paste on there. So that's why it's taking me a while to kind of work it across because I'm trying to make sure it's a nice thin layer. What's the benefit of that? Of the cut paste? I'm using a um, it just allows buds that are going to come out underneath it. Like I've used cut paste and seen them bud out underneath it. If it's too thick, it can be hard for them to bud through it. If it's nice and thin, because you're, all you're trying to do is hold moisture in. So you don't need a giant thick layer. It's airtight, even at a thin layer. So, um, but you want buds to be able to bud through there. There we go. Look at that. Sealed, dealed, we're done. So that's a little little project. We could wire out this branch here, um, but I don't think it's necessary. We're probably just gonna cut it back and regrow another one later. So I'll just move on from this one and do our final little guy. So before I get into this guy, everybody doing okay, I hope? We still got some viewers out there and nobody's sleeping yet, right? I've gotten one restaurant recommendation, so. Okay, so our next one, this is a, a tree that has some problems. That's kind of why I picked it too, is I wanted you guys to see how you, how you sort through some of this stuff, okay? And it might even be easier. Eh, I don't know, you guys can see pretty good. How does that look? Can you see the branches pretty good? Pretty good? Okay. So some of our issues that we have right off the bat, because I don't want to take too much time defoliating it for you guys, um, is we have a lot of bar branches. So a ton, a ton of bar branches. Now this tree is going to be styled pretty much what we're used to. We have some growth that we can work on. We have some growth that we can wire. We also do have a lot that we need to uh, take care of, just like those bar branches I was mentioning. So the first thing I'm going to do is probably work through and get rid of some of these ugly bars. And I'm probably just going to take this large, big uh, branch off. So let me see what it looks like. Cut back first. Can you request for a, a trunk chop? A trunk chop? Yeah. On this? I know, the oh. same trunk chop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if I trunk chop it any smaller, it'll be to the dirt. No, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, that can can help. I get what they're saying. They're like, everything you do. Yeah, bar branch chop. Yeah, we're getting rid of these bar branches. 
more cutting. And that's the reality of it. It is a lot of cutting. You know, it's a lot of cutting stuff off and regrowing as bonsai. Okay, so Some Italian restaurant recommendation downtown? Ooh, I love Italian food. What is it? Olive in June? Oh, heck yeah. Oh, what's that place? Um, Tomo. Tomo, do you like sushi? Yeah, I do. Yeah, Tomo is <gasps> not too far away. Like five minutes. Yeah. What, do you like sushi? Nice like that place a lot. You like sushi too? Oh, yeah. Could you do sushi? They're open. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. I just want to make sure everybody's, you know, we're covering everyone's bases here. Okay, so I've just removed a few branches so far, nothing critical, so I haven't done anything worth noting yet. I'm just kind of clearing out some bar branches, starting to try and find my design in here. And I keep thinking I see it. Okay. Mike, can we go back to the seed biscuit? Yeah. Really quick. Sure. Uh, Mike wants to know what do you think the success rate will be for all those grows? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I wouldn't normally say that. Uh, so not every tree will be a hundred percent, but the sea hibiscus will be a hundred percent. If any graft on that tree, I'm a little worried about is that top one being a little thin. But I can. I will. I I will almost want to say I guarantee my butt on these two. I will say those. I, I don't foresee them not making. Um, CI Biscuits has had the highest success rate of anything I've grafted, and we're sitting probably now that I've worked out some of the kinks at like almost 100%. I've maybe lost a few in my last uh, last three or four times doing it. So it's it's something I'm very confident in um, now. So I don't I don't think we'll have any issues with it. I think all three will make it. Yeah. But you know, it doesn't mean that. Uh, if your graphs don't make it, what do you do? Like, what can you do if your graphs don't make it? What's the easiest thing you can do if your graphs don't make it? Do them again. You know, keep doing them until they take. Because you've already committed to making the wound. You've already made the wound. So you might as well um, keep reopening it, keep trying to do it, um, and get the graph to take if you can. You've got to learn that it, you're only going to learn the technique by making mistakes, you know. So start on young material, try it. Even if you're just trying to only get the graft to take, like don't, aside from doing bonsai, just take a small tree and just say, I just want to see if I can graft this to this. And you'll learn that technique. And once you're comfortable with it, you'll get better and better. And you'll be like, all right, now I'm ready to do my like trees I care about. So, um, but we got to start, you got to start somewhere, you know. Oh. Okay, the yeah, so for, for most tropicals, I'm not going to say all, all of them. Like, don't do button ones. Anything slightly finicky, you should approach with more caution. But ficus, yes, especially at this stage in the game. Uh, when I'm doing this, I would just repot them. You, you, it might not be the, the happiest thing for the plant. It might be perfect world. You might want to, you know, uh, do this work and then wait a little bit of time and then repot. But this tree is super, super strong. It's going to handle it, and you're just wasting time. So just handle the business, get through it, and then you know, you'll know you be on the other side. Uh, you won't have to worry about it. So at this stage, because we're doing such aggressive work too, we're preparing this tree already for repotting. Like I've already taken off a ton of foliage, so I can already cut a ton of roots. So usually I kind of approach them at the same time. Okay. So I think I do have a pretty good idea of what this tree is going to look like now. All right, so I am going to do a little bit of wiring on this tree. This is what I kind of saved my the 2.0 for. Yeah. Okay. okay. So just bear with me, guys. I'm just going to start wiring this out. If you have any questions, you know, shoot them on over. I'm happy to answer them. Until 9 o'clock, then we're going to the Italian place. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. The sushi spot does do takeout, 2 to 10. Really? Yeah. Schwing. Are, is any restaurants dining in Austin? They, it's opened up for business, actually. It is? Some of them chose to stay for us, but a lot of them. 
Florida's, yeah, Florida's just like, yeah, we never even close. We barely close. <laughs> Like someone wants to know, why do you flat cut versus cutting diagonal? I guess maybe hibiscus. Um, so because of flat cut, you never know where your buds are going to happen. So if you, for instance, let me see. Yeah. So if I flat cut, let me just get a good flat cut like this. There we go. If I flat cut like this, I don't know exactly where my buds are going to pop. They might pop here. They might pop there. They might pop under it. Um, but I know that when it, wherever it pops, that's where I'm going to cut the, the next cut. Because if I cut it based off of an angle, like if I say, okay, I want to angle it to the back. Well, you don't have a branch there. So what makes you think it's going to pop at the point that you angle it? You have to wait until you have a branch there and then angle it. So the flush cut gives you the best chance to see where the bud's going to pop without risking the chance that you're going to flush cut it and then just kill that portion. So you got to make sure you have a branch before you angle cut. You've got to angle cut to a branch. And I never, never angle cut if I don't have a branch. If it's just a trunk chop with no branch that I'm cutting back to, 100% of the time it's straight across, 100%. So I, uh, it'll just save you any hassle of having to have die back like that. Oh, really, really well. So I'd say, you know, their, their full size is probably um, maybe two and a half inches, maybe three inches on the biggest ones. Uh, but they can reduce down to consistently maybe half inch, you know, consistently. So well within the realm of, of using for show hen. Good questions. Now they're really firing off. Someone said you should go to Nancy's Sky Garden to uh, have a vegan a meal. That's some round rock. To have a what? A vegan meal. A nice vegan meal would be to go to Nancy's Sky Garden. I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> What is it? Oh, I do love Thai, too. I love Thai. Do you like Thai food, too? Oh, me too, man. Yeah. I love Thai curry. Well, I'm down for whatever, man. Guy's kind of a pain, but okay. So I'm just trying to work through wiring all these little guys, and that is something you'll notice is that when you're wiring in a, on a show hen, it's not very easy because it's a very, very small section you got to wire. So just take your time. I actually would say I find it more difficult to wire show hen than I do bigger trees. Mm -hmm. cool. Yep, so I am going to go for banyan style. So banyan style, um, there are some key points to banyan style. It needs to be about two times as wide as it is tall. Okay, so that's one of the things I'm setting is this is going to be a pretty uh, broad show hen. The other thing is aerial roots. Some people, I talk, talked to Brandon about this earlier, and the theory is, is split between how people want to grow it. There are some people that, if you like, are all about the Japanese way of growing bonsai, then the aerial roots are always going to work against you. They're always going to be ruining your taper. So if you're into taper and that's your primary goal, then aerial roots are only going to work against you. If you really, really like banyan trees and you want a true banyan, though, there are people who argue that you can't do it without aerial roots, that a, a true ficus has aerial roots and you need to just deal with the reverse taper and not have hang-ups. Um, so 
where I stand, I usually don't use aerial roots on my designs, um, but you can use them to a great effect. The only issue is, as I was telling Brandon, is the aerial root will start to feed the tree more than the actual trunk. And so you'll start getting these like Popeye arms. Like this guy, the forearm will get real huge because it's feeding off the aerial root, and then you have the skinny, weak little bicep. So um, nobody say that's how my arms look either. But uh, so that's one of the reasons why I don't like the aerial roots. But they do really convey that that sense of a banyan. And me being from Florida, I mean, it's you know we have great banyan trees everywhere, and so it doesn't really look like a true banyan without those aerial roots. So you gotta you gotta kind of pick your poison, so to speak. Would you ever graft an aerial root on there? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If you needed a, a an aerial root, you can definitely graft them. How would you go about doing that then? Um, how did I do that? Let me think about the theory behind this. Usually you have to graft, so it would be like how we had that peg graft. Mm -hmm. You'd have to kind of start grafting the top section and just kind of and then just remove the back. You'd essentially just or even just do like an approach graft. Here's another way to do it. Okay. Just like an approach graft, same way you would do like a root graft. You just kind of get something that already has the aerial root kind of next to it, and then once it's fused, you just cut the top off and leave the aerial root. That would probably be the best way. Um, I think I'm almost out of 2.0. So we're almost out of what I can like what I can ideally wire with, and luckily I've only got two real important branches to do, and then I can use light wire. Kind of cheating. No, I'm good. I'm good, man. This is the last tree. How are we doing for time? Yeah, right here at uh, 3 to 9. Nice. It's that time management, man. You learn that in bonsai, too. I didn't even know. I just sensed it. Like it's got to be getting close. Uh, Mike, someone wants to know how you get aerial roots to grow constant misting. That's, that's one way. Um, so honestly, this is going to sound so crazy. One of the easiest ways to get aerial roots to grow is to let your tree get pot bound. Um, the next thing is going to be, and I'll go back to the pot bound thing in a second. The next thing is going to be humidity. So you need high humidity to get the aerial roots and shade, you know, put them into the shade. But honestly, what I've noticed is once they get pot bound, so it, to understand what a ficus is, it's a semi-epiphyte. So they start their life as like a fig that a bird eats the fig and then goes flies away and deposits that fig in a palm tree. That fig starts growing as a strangler fig, as an epiphyte in the palm. So it has no roots in contact with the ground. So all those roots for the first few years of its life are only absorbing moisture through the palm fibers and through the air, an epiphytic plant. So the same thing happens when they fill the pot with too many roots, they'll eventually go back to semi-epiphytic form and they'll start dropping the aerial roots to try and account for where they can't push roots in the pot. So that's one of the easiest ways to do it. But mixing it with um, humidity and maybe even some sphagnum moss in the area you want uh, aerial roots, that can help. Scarification on, micro, on tiger bark works very, very well too. You cut something and it will push an aerial root out of it. So, um, so that can work very, very well as well. Okay. So I think we got enough of it wired to at least convey what I'm trying to convey. So you see, this is what we're going for here now. I wanted the front. I kind of switched it over using this as my first branch. And notice we talked earlier about sometimes you're using branches you wouldn't normally use. These branches are way too low to use on a traditional larger bonsai. You wouldn't go out and have a um, chuhin sized bonsai with branches growing right uh, one millimeter out of the soil like that. On shohin, it's fine. You have to kind of build out that canopy somehow and you're only building out in a four to six inch range realistically. So you have to kind of build those branches out from wherever you can get them and still follow the good horticultural rules. So I did try to get rid of most of the uh, bar branches uh, there are still a little bit of cluster in here, but I don't think it's going to be bad. 
Um, the only one that might be an issue is this guy off here, and he's arguably a, a trifurcation and not a bifurcation, but I think it'll be fine. So now I would honestly go back to just running these low branches, get those thick, and I'd probably just keep refining this stuff and be, oh, are we done? Oh, 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 my bad, my bad. So, um, so I'd probably just keep the top refined. You don't need your branches to be huge at the top, but you definitely let these lower branches get a little fatter before I'd go into just pruning them into the design. So, um, so that's, that's at least a few offerings of how to approach shohen bonsai, a few ways to kind of make shohen bonsai. So I know it was, uh, we're very wordy. I know there was a lot of information there. But I hope that it plants the seed somewhere that maybe when we're watering or when we're doing our trees, some of this stuff will come back up and, and help you guys out in some situations, okay? So um, I don't get to give you guys my normal goodbye and say goodbye to all you in person, but thank you guys all for tuning in and for asking your questions and for most of all having me up here to give this program. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to work with your club and to work with you guys. So thank you. thanks again for having me up here. Do we have any questions before we go? Uh, I, I just had one in there. You, what? Uh, Jacob just says, uh, do, you, do you like to use aerial roots closer to the trunk to fatten the trunk and add texture? You can, yeah, you can do that depending on where they are. So I, it's a case by case basis. Um, but on Banyan style, typically the roots, like if you want to grade aerial roots, aerial roots that drop from the branches are more valuable than ones dropping from the trunk, aesthetic wise. But for what you're saying, trunk thickening wise, yeah, I have pinned them to the trunk and they have thickened the trunk that way. Um, it doesn't always look good though. So it's not a technique I'd say I do all the time. It's a case by case basis. But good questions, Jacob. It was nice talking to you, at least through Zoom. So cool, man. All right, guys, have a great night and uh, I'll see you guys in Florida. All right, good night, guys. Thanks, Jacob.